standing next to her. Every time Sarah steps up to the podium, I get excited because I'm not really sure what we're going to get. You know, a press briefing, a bunch of lies, or divided into softball teams. <laughs> it's shirts and skins, and this time don't be such a little b Jim Acosta. <laughs> I actually really like Sarah. I think she's very resourceful. Like, she burns facts, and then she uses that ash to create a perfect smoky eye. <laughs> like, maybe she's born with it. Maybe it's lies. Probably lies. <laughs> and I'm never really sure what to call Sarah Huckabee Sanders. You know, is it Sarah Sanders? Is it Sarah Huckabee Sanders? Is it Cousin Huckabee? Is it Auntie Huckabee Sanders? Like, what's Uncle Tom but for white women who disappoint other white women? Hilarious, Michelle Wolf. So when that party, when those people who voted for Joe Biden and for Hillary Clinton, tell you they care. They care about the illegal immigrants crossing our border. They're lying to you. They don't give a damn. Keep up with what's trending. Subscribe on YouTube today. Trending now on The Charlie Kirk Show. They are not insurgents and we are not being invaded, which, by the way, is a white supremacist idea, philosophy. She doesn't know what philosophy means, and that's OK. She's, she's not very bright. She has a very big, very substantial following, I should say. Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez. That's baseball, America. Baseball is free falling. My favorite story of the day, which is not the most important story of the day, but um, Rob Manfred is the cement head who runs baseball. And you wouldn't know him if you bumped into him on a subway, right? You wouldn't know Rob Manfred from Joe Bag of Donuts. So Rob Manfred got up on a podium and decided that the Georgia election law was a reason that he had to pull the all-star game from Atlanta effectively giving Georgia to the Republicans forever because he screwed every person living near the stadium, every business that banked on. It was a big deal and you screwed Georgia over a law that was uh, manifestly fine. It's a voter security law. It expanded voting in some ways. It required voter ID and others. Uh, he fell for all the talking points, proves he doesn't read anything, proves he's got terrible advisors and made a mockery of himself. And by the way, Delta did the same thing and, uh, and Coke did the same thing because they were virtue signaling. And now Manfred, though, uh, this is, I shouldn't take delight in the woes of another. It turns out that Rob Manfred <clears throat> has some ties to Georgia. It turns out that Rob Manfred is a member of Augusta, the most exclusive club in America. It's like if you have white privilege, uh, as a sign, it's got Augusta National Golf Course underneath it as a symbol. Oh, not that. Look, they, they integrated years ago, and Condi Rice is a member, and they let Lee Elders play at least within 20 years. So Augusta's made some token moves, but Augusta really is. It's where the rich white guys go to play golf, and Bobby Jones and Ike and stuff like that. And it's been that way for a long time, and we overlook it because we love the Masters. So Rob Manfred, by virtue of his being allegedly powerful. He's not. The owners are powerful, but the owners need a front guy just like the NFL commissioner, whatever his name is, is a member of Augusta. Uh, the big boys belong to Augusta and Rob Manfred belongs to Augusta. So Marco Rubio drops out a note and says, will you be resigning from Augusta? Because I mean, is it Georgia for me, but not for thee? Is that the whole deal with Major League Baseball? Major League Baseball can't come to Georgia because Georgia has gone Cro-Magnon in its voting laws, which it didn't. 
Uh, yeah, so Rob Manfred makes this big virtue signal. And then Marco Rubio asks, wait a minute, you belong to Augusta. I mean, we're talking Augusta, Georgia, home of white privilege, the original, you know, exclusive men's club. I know we've got a token woman or two and a couple of minorities running around, but it is the essence of white privilege, Rob Manfred. And so now I'm looking at a Wall Street Journal story. Rob Menfred pulled the MLB All-Star game from Georgia. Will he attend the Masters? That's not the question. If he is so upset about the Georgia law, he should resign from Augusta. Now, they have, they have given the Major League Baseball All-Star game to Coors Field in Colorado, and they apparently did not check on the voting laws in Colorado, which are more restrictive than the voting laws in Georgia. Moreover, I don't know if open carry is the rule in Colorado. I think it is. I know it's in Minnesota. But the gun people are not going to be happy about this because it's still the West. And the West has a whole lot more freedom about guns than Georgia does. So Rob Manfred threw his sport into a giant stinking swamp. And it's sinking. Now, at the same time that Georgia became anathema to the left, and that Major League Baseball became the official sport of the Democratic Party, and Delta became the official airline of the Democratic Party, and Coca-Cola became the official soft drink of the Democratic Party. At the same time, United Airlines felt left out. Nobody was writing about how virtuous United Airlines was at Vox or uh, talking about on MSNBC. So United Airlines began to tweet against the Texas law and in favor of voting rights. I have no earthly idea why they did this. United Airlines, I know that President Obama's former press secretary has become their spokesperson, and maybe he is going to drag United down single-handedly. But where are the shareholders? I mean, Major League Baseball has just shed customers and viewers and merch buyers left and right. But United's got to run an airline that's got to have passengers. And now that it's a Democrat airline, Really, was that necessary either? And I still haven't gotten to the bad news. Stay tuned. Trending now on the Eric Metaxas Show. Uh, did you move to L.A. from New York? I moved very shortly out there after because while I couldn't write for Letterman, I was perfect for Johnny Carson. And so I asked my now friend, David Letterman, would he please send a package out to, to his connections? He's already been guest hosting that show for years right, and right. whatnot. So what happened? The Tonight Show said, nah, we're not interested. Yeah, Johnny was going through a miserable divorce. Um, and, and by the way, I, I remember the very first joke because he did use some of the material I sent out. The very first joke. Now, you wouldn't be able to do this joke today because it's body shaming. And you have to remember the reference is, uh, I guess, now 35, maybe even, gosh. Is this a Tony Fields joke or a Mama Cass Elliott joke? Sort of. Sort of. All right. Remember Karnak the Magnificent? The answer is, the answer is hip, hip, hooray. The question, describe Liz Taylor putting on her jeans. That is a great joke. What do you mean you can't do a joke like that today? That is a great joke. You just did it on this program. <laughs> I love it. Hip, hip. So has that right, joke so, ever appeared anywhere? Um, yes, every time I'm on the air. <laughs> every time you're on the air. Hip, hip, right. Well, when you write a joke like that, that's like a, I, I think um, Dick Cavett's first major joke was uh, uh, what, what, what uh, there's a new restaurant and it's, uh, it's Chinese German. Uh, the only problem is an hour after you eat there, you're hungry for power. <laughs> that's, uh, that's, yeah. that's a big joke. Yep. It's a stupid joke, but I mean, it's anyway. Okay, so hip hip hooray. Now, can, I, can I tell a, a, a slightly off color joke? If you don't, we'll be offended. Keep up with what's trending. Subscribe on YouTube today. Trending now on the Mike Gallagher Show. Coca-Cola cowards read the damn bill. 
doesn't suppress anybody unless you're of the mindset, you know, if you're black, you're too dumb to figure out how to get ID to vote. That's suppression because we know how black people are. You know how brown people are. They're not intelligent enough to get an ID put together. They can't go down to the DMV or they can't figure out a way to get just a state ID. They're, no, no, they can't. We can't expect our poor black friends to do that. That's the left. That's the mindset. That's the thinking of Democrats. Now, Ed Bastian's company, Delta, won't be so forgiving for somebody who's too ignorant to get an ID and let them get on their plane. Because you can't fly Delta without a photo ID, a legitimate ID. But don't you dare expect a black or brown Georgian to be smart enough to figure out how to produce an ID when they vote. That's suppression. No, that's not suppression. That's idiocy. That's, that, that is stupidity at the highest level, and everybody knows it. So good for the Georgia State Legislature for pushing back and, and telling Delta to go stick it in your ear. And they ought to say the same thing. They ought to do the same thing to, to Coca-Cola, to Home Depot, to any of these companies who are playing this pitiful game of lying about the Georgia election integrity law. They are lies. Keep up with what's trending. Subscribe on YouTube today. Trending now on The Dennis Prager Show. Right now, uh, if it hasn't happened, it will happen. They will simply declare classics as an example of white supremacy. Absolutely. I think that is where we're headed. Um, and it's a shame because classics really taught me how to analytically think and critically think. And I think that's where I developed a lot of the foundation for being able to reason through things. And it's funny, I came out as a conservative um, maybe six or seven months ago. And a lot of people who had also studied classics, even though it's a small major at Cal, um, had reached out to me and said that they, too, were closet conservatives, um, which I thought was very interesting that maybe that major is producing some people who can think for themselves. <laughs> yeah, well, that, that's my old belief. Study Cicero <laughs> and think clearly. Absolutely. That's a major motto. Can you say that in Latin? Um, not, probably not. <laughs> <laughs> You say you came out as a conservative six months ago. Were you in the closet until then? Yeah, so I have always been politically inclined, and I went to Berkeley um, really not knowing what I believed. Um, and I quickly started to realize, Welcome back, America. Hugh Hewitt. The date was July 12, 1974. I had graduated from high school and was preparing to go off to college. I didn't even know what happened. I was 18 at the time. I was born in 1956. July 12, 1974. You're thinking to yourself, oh, wait a minute. Nixon resigned in August. He's not talking about Nixon. No, I'm, I'm not talking about Nixon. I'm talking about the Congressional Budget and Impoundment Control Act of 1974. Now that is a killer, right? You are, right now your hand is reaching for the button 
or you're about to tell Alexa, Alexa, play Dennis Prager. Don't do that. That would be terrible. Or you're about to, if you've got a 1955 Pontiac, you're about to turn the radio down. But listen to me. Give me a second. The Congressional Budget and Impoundment Control Act of 1974 became law on July 12th, 1974. And Congress changed the United States fiscal year from July 1 to October 1, and they set up a process known as reconciliation. And the idea was every year the president would send in his budget or her budget in about this time of the year. Biden hadn't done it yet. President Biden's been preoccupied. Dogs biting everyone. He's been upset. And so the budget comes in and then the Senate and the House budget committees pass their budget and then they reconcile them and then they send instructions off to the various subcommittees of Congress. This is how much money you have to spend, for example, on armed services or the appropriations committee or in, and here are some instructions on what you may or may not do. And here's what we're going to do for spending overall. We're going to spend this much money and we're going to tax this much. And that was done once a year since 1974. So for 48 years, it's run that way. 48 years, there's been one Budget Reconciliation Act a year. And that act is not subject to the filibuster. So all you need is 50 votes plus the vice president, 51 votes. The Democrats have 50 votes in the Senate. Don't need 60 votes. And so the first thing that Chuck Schumer did was pass, uh, was it 3 trillion? I've lost track. It's 2 trillion. Was it 3 trillion or 2 trillion? We've lost track. We've lo we are now anesthetized to, to the trillion. I think it was 2 trillion. First thing he passed was a $2 trillion, $1.9 trillion bill. And that money wasn't paid for. No one's taxes went up, nothing. He just borrowed it. And I began by telling you about the national debt clock. But, you know, the borrowing of that right now is at $28 trillion in change. And $28 trillion is a lot, but, but it's going to go up $2 trillion because Chuck Schumer and Nancy Pelosi agreed just to borrow it. And we thought, okay, we're safe for a year. All they did was spend $2 trillion. We can repair that when Biden leaves and a Republican comes in. Well, yesterday, the Senate parliamentarian ruled for the first time in 48 years that you can do as many budget reconciliations as you want per year. Now, the, the rule is you can only do taxing and spending in a budget reconciliation. You can't, you can't pass H.R. 1, which would give the vote to plants. Uh, and you cannot... Uh, uh, you can't raise the minimum wage to $150 an hour. These are all Democratic proposals, as you know. Uh, you can't make AOC royalty. You can't do anything that's not related to spending and budget. But you can spend more money than we've got and just print it. Or you can tax everything that moves. And in the first reconciliation that went through, nothing was taxed. It was just all free money, very inflationary. And that's why the 10-year Treasury has crept up um, repeatedly since we, we got there. It, it's crept back up. I'm trying to figure out where it is now by looking on my ever-ready uh, CNBC pre-market thing. But but Dwayne broke Google Chrome for some reason. I don't know why it's not working, but it, it isn't. Uh, I'll look on this. And so we have a 10-year treasury of around 1.6, something like that. And yeah, it's... Uh, I do not know why my screen keeps resetting to the bottom of the screen. Dwayne, why did you break this? I, 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 I leave for five minutes and he breaks the screen. So I can't tell you what the 10-year treasury is. Just give me a second here and I'll look it up. The 10-year treasury is the interest rate on which all interest rates are based. And it, it really tells you the state of the economy. And the 10-year treasury this morning is at, we're looking, we're looking, we're looking, looking, um, oh, there it is. 1.72 percent. It it ticked up. It went up a little bit because money became more expensive because money's being printed at an alarming rate. And so your 30 year interest rate for your home loan went up just a bit. I was down at Andrew and Todd dot com yesterday uh, watching them work, 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 because everybody in the country is either buying a house or refinancing a house. And andrewandtodd.com is where they do that, 888-888-1172. They're lenders. If you want to call them, that's a free free 
giveaway to andrewandtodd.com, but they were working around the clock. Talk about a sweatshop. They're happy. I mean, they're like the seven dwarves. Aho, uh, hi ho, off to lend we go. And that's what they do at andrewandtodd.com, triple eight, triple eight, eleven seventy two. Well, yesterday the parliamentarian ruled that Chuck Schumer can pass another reconciliation bill and another, uh, technically an amendment to the one that he passed, and then another one, and then another one, and then another one. And this is going to kind of shake the markets a little bit. We knew he had one more bite at the apple where they're going to raise corporate taxes and spend more money on infrastructure on a straight party line vote. 51 votes in the Senate and um, they've got 325 to 315, I think, is this is the House, something like that, or 323 to uh, one, uh, 217, so, uh, two, 230. I don't know what the House is. It's five vote different. And so it's very close in both houses, an equally divided legislature, but the Democrats have the tiniest, tiniest margin of error. One vote in the Senate, five votes in the House. And they're going to jam through another $3 trillion this year and then another $3 trillion next year. And that national debt, which is at $28 trillion and 135% of the GDP, is going to go to $35 trillion. That's what's going to happen. What will that end? So the Wall Street Journal headline is Senate Parliamentarian Rules in Favor of Democratic Reconciliation Effort. This is doom. This is uh, advance word by Carrier Pigeon, by Pony Express, by The Matrix. Doom has arrived. We have taken all restraint off of a one vote Democratic margin. Now, Joe Manchin and Kristen Cinema of West Virginia and Arizona, and I think Angus King are rational about this. And Chris Coons is a smart guy, and he knows we can't do this either. So hopefully Chris Coons comes into the caucus and says, what are you guys nuts? Have you looked at the debt? The debt is at 135% of GDP. It was at 55% of GDP uh, 20 years ago. If we keep doing this, we will be Argentina in the 80s. We will be Weimar Republic. If you print that much money, and, and I explain it to you again in terms for the Steelers fans. If everybody in Pittsburgh has $5,000 and there are 100 cars in Pittsburgh, the most that anyone's going to pay is, you know, someone might pay $2,000 for it. Some, some Steelers fan might pay $5,000, but the, the amount of money is limited and the number of cars is limited. And so they'll find an equilibrium between what someone is wanting to pay and what they will pay. And other people will say, no, I'll go to Cleveland and get my car for a hundred bucks. But the Steelers fans being slow, they won't figure it out. But the amount of money changes the price of the good because there are only a hundred cars to buy. And if you increase everyone in Pittsburgh from $5,000 per person to $10,000 per person, then the car is going to probably double in price. It's, a, it's just a basic law. If you give people more money, they will spend more money to get what they need. That's called inflation. So when the Democrats get to print as much money as they want, inflation is going to come and the interest rates are going to go up. Now, we have had an artificial hold on interest rates for a very, 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 very long time. A couple of years. The Fed has said they're not going to change that interest rate at all for a while, for a year and a half. So it's going to build up and build up and build up. And then when it's unleashed, it's going to be wild. It's just going to be wild. So the Senate parliamentarian doomed us yesterday. Joe Manchin said he's not in favor of raising the corporate tax. They got to raise some taxes to pay for this, although they actually could just print the money and they might do that. They might just print the money. Democrats just might say, we're going to spend $5 trillion and take the national debt to $32 trillion or $33 trillion or $40 trillion. Why not? I'm not, they don't have a real good grasp on economics. The whole inflation thing eludes them. I have to get Brian Westbury on to explain it for Steelers fans and the Democratic Senate. They might spend $10 trillion. They might give everyone $2,800, like they just gave people $1,400. Why not? Why not print money? Joe Biden's over there saying, send me anything, I'll sign it. What am I doing here? And so they'll send over, it's a great deal for incumbent politicians, they don't have to pay the piper. But it used to be they could only do it once a year. 
Yesterday, the parliamentarian said you can do it as many times as you want. So you cannot give Hillary Clinton a royalty title. That might otherwise slip through, and you can't pay HR1. You can't do that. But you can spend as much as you want and tax as much as you want, as often as you want on 51 votes. And there was a shudder in the uh, force yesterday. The force, there's a great disturbance in the force. It's always in the stuff you don't understand, the stories you don't read. Senate parliamentarian rules in favor of democratic reconciliation effort. That sounds pretty normal, right? That's the headline. What the hell does that mean? That means we are going to spend like we have never spent before. And behind that comes inflation. And I remind you, the first house that the fetching Mrs. Hewitt and I bought in 1985 was 12 and a half percent on a 30 year loan. 12 and a half percent. I don't know, we were crazy. It's what you could do, you had to buy a house, right? Had a baby on the way, get a house. You gotta find some space. 12 and a half percent, what's that mean to a, a 27 year old? You know, I don't know what 12 and a half percent means. My dad thought I was nuts. Well, right now you can buy a house at andrewandtodd.com and you'll get a 3% loan, or maybe a 2.8, maybe a 3.5, depends on your credit. Not, I, this is gonna be, you just better own property now. God forbid if you don't own property. I don't know what rents are gonna do in this country. They can't build houses fast enough. I do not know what rents are gonna do because people, they're just gonna charge what the market can bear. And we're gonna print money and then we're gonna print some more money and then we're gonna print some more money. And you heard it here first. Time for my relieffactor.com. All right, that time of the day, I always take this regardless of the headache I've got. I just scared the heck out of all you people. Go out and buy a house and get some relieffactor.com and stay in shape because you're going to have to live to 150 to pay off this debt. This is not my problem. This is my kid's problem and my grandkid's problem. Stone cold coffee. Thank you, Dwayne. Um, I, I, I must tell you, relieffactor.com goes down so easy. You can take it with absolute stone cold coffee. And it doesn't matter. The Icarian, the Curcumin, the Resveratrol, and the Omega, they taste great. You can't taste them. And down they go like that. And what do they do? They support the temporary relief on the minor aches and pains that come from exercise. And I'm going to have to walk a long way today because I, I woke up and saw that Baylor won and the parliamentarian ruled. And I said, the end of times is upon us. This is really uh, Roman revolution stuff. Stay tuned, America. I'm Hugh Hewitt. Trending now on The Larry Elder Show. Biden makes these assertions about this Georgia law. He says you can't give people water. He says it shrinks voting hours, both of which are lies. Now, as you know, a man who now lives in Florida was dogged for four years with a running tab by one of the major newspapers about all the lies he tells. Biden tells this big Massive lies, does them quietly, doesn't scream or yell. Media doesn't say a damn thing. Now, is that because the media doesn't know he's lying? Or doesn't care? Biden said, and Nancy Pelosi just reiterated it yesterday, that 83%, notice it's never 82, never 84, it's always 83, 83% of the Trump tax cuts went to the top 1%. It's a lie. Factcheck.org says it's not true. That's a left-wing organization run by the Annenberg Foundation that's also left-wing, the Annenberg Center. PolitiFact, also run by a left-wing organization, said it's not true. Washington Post, the Washington Post, as you know, has not endorsed a Republican for president in its entire history. That's how left-wing they are. They said it's not true. The left claimed the top 1% are undertaxed. It's a lie. My point is, Biden says these things. Keep up with what's trending. Subscribe on YouTube today. Trending now on America First with Sebastian Gorka. I had a kind of epiphany today. Maybe I'm a big softy deep down. If you believe that, 
I got a bridge to sell you. But sometimes, especially, let me get personal. Not when I get attacked, but even then, when it's really vituperative, when it's really despicable, I have a certain feeling. But when they attack my family, and when they've attacked my children, there's usually a point in the year where I just find myself asking a certain question, a very human question. Why do they do that? Why would you do that to a fellow human being? And it puzzles me because I could never do that. I can be harsh. I can be very robust in what I say. Some would say aggressive. But it's not because I detest and wish to destroy human beings. Fifty-one minutes after the hour, America. That music means David M. Drucker's in the house from the Washington Examiner. Follow him on Twitter, David M. Drucker. Good morning, David. Hey, good morning, Hugh. Um, the Senate parliamentarian, I have been trying to instruct the audience on what this means, and it means, you know, free money. I, I, that's all I could come up with. It just means that President Biden gets his infrastructure bill uh, Joe Biden gets any tax hike that he can get past Joe Manchin and Kristen Cinema, and we're in for massive deficits. How do you read it? Well, that sounds like the most likely possibility. Um, I think that the Democrats are going to have a little bit tougher of a time agreeing on this bill than they did on the first bill, COVID relief uh, plus, 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 with a bunch of other stuff. Uh, there was an urgency about that because it was still built around the pandemic. Uh, this is a jobs plan, so-called, and, and and it will, you know, theoretically lead to a lot of jobs if the infrastructure plans are are built, but there's a whole bunch of other stuff built into this. I think the important thing to remember here that I have learned in almost 20 years of covering American politics is that there's no constituency for debts and deficits. There are no deficit hawks. American voters don't care, and that includes American voters of both political parties. They think they care, but what they really care is not allowing the other side to spend money they don't like. They are very much in favor of spending money they do like, and that's about the thick of it. And so Biden, I think, will have carte blanche, pending Democrats agreeing with themselves to spend a whole bunch of money, I don't think American voters, by and large, will care if and until there are negative consequences. And one of the things we've experienced since uh, Reagan took care of the last inflationary and high interest rate period we had is that even when we do overspend, and it hasn't been to this level, but even when we do overspend, a lot of the dire warnings about what's going to happen and turning into Greece or whatever country we're supposed to turn into, it's never happened. And I don't think American voters really think anything bad's going to happen. If something bad actually happens, they may change their mind on this. They may rediscover uh, their deficit hawk roots, at least some voters. But I don't think you're going to see any complaints, really, um, if and until that happens. I, I agree. I, I've been explaining to people today the national debt when Reagan took over was 55 percent of Actually, when Reagan took over, it was 35% of GDP. So if we had a $100 million GDP, we had a $35 million debt. It is now 130%. And nothing bad's happened, right? 1980 to 2020, for 40 years, we have been inflation-free. So people don't know what inflation does, but you and I both remember it because uh, we bought houses during it. And it it's a killer. And the question is, now that they've changed reconciliation, 
Can the Democrats resist political pressure to just spend and spend and spend? There's a limit to the taxes, and Joe Manchin sets that limit. Yesterday he said he doesn't like 28%. He thought 25% sounded right. So that's what the corporate tax is going to, 25%. Joe Manchin gets to call all this stuff. But he'll also raise the highest income tax, right? I mean, they'll, they'll pass all sorts of taxes, but it won't make a lick of difference given this size of debt. And I, I wouldn't blame him. This is how Democrats get elected. They promise to spend money. That's what they do. Right. You know, a Republican consultant once told me or tells me regularly that Republicans are put on earth to do a couple of things. And one of those things is to cut taxes. Uh, yes. And Democrats, you know, this is an old school. This is old school Democratic politics. Right. I mean, this is in some way should be reassuring, I suppose, if you're a Republican who, who you know, blanches at full Democratic control of government. They're, they're trying to spend a lot of money. They've been interested in spending a lot of money. Uh, as long as I've been alive, uh, Bill Clinton smartly renamed spending, relabeled investment. People yeah. like the sound of that. Yeah. But this is nothing new. And coming out of an, a crisis, a pandemic that upended the economy and everything else, people are inclined to look to government for help. And even if it makes them a little uncomfortable, they figure, hey, look, it is warranted. And whatever Joe, problems Joe Biden is going to have over the next few years, and I expect he'll have them, and he's already having some of them. I don't think any of it's going to have to do with his economic agenda, again, unless there, after 40 years, is finally, you know, some of these negative repercussions that conservative economists worry about. Yeah, and, and I think it will first show up in housing costs, because right now people can't buy a house because there aren't enough houses. And so they run around. You've seen what's going on in D.C. It's going on on the West Coast. It's going on everywhere, Austin, Texas. People cannot even get an offer in. And that's because there aren't enough houses and everyone's got money and more money is on the way. So, David Drucker, yeah. my, my predict, I just want a prediction from you. How many reconciliations do you think Chuck Schumer will pass now? Now he can do an unlimited number of 51 votes. He can't pass H.R. 1. He can't do any of the crazy social stuff, but he can raise taxes and he can increase spending via reconciliation with 51 votes. How high is the sky for him? Well, the sky's the limit. And in particular, he doesn't want to have to worry about a Democratic primary in 2022. And so I think that, you know, and, and, and I think, you know, maybe a lot of your listeners will, listeners will think I'm crazy, but Chuck Schumer <laughs> was really a pretty pragmatic Democrat over the years, but he has embraced the liberal side of himself if for no other reason uh, for self-preservation. The sky is the limit. You heard it from David Drucker. Trust it. David M. Drucker on Twitter. I'll be back hour number two straight ahead, America, on The Hugh Hewitt Show. Trending now on The Charlie Kirk Show. This is a teacher-student dialogue of a Zoom class in Virginia. Listen carefully. Play tape. Tell me what, what this seems to be a picture of. It's just two people chilling. Right, just two people. <laughs> That's nothing more to this picture? No, nah, not really. Just two people chilling. I don't believe that you believe that. Um, I don't believe that you look at this as just two people. Um, I don't think truly you truly is just two people, though, is it not? Yeah, but I think you're being, I think you're being, um, I think you're being intentionally coy about what this is a picture of. <laughs> what would I be being coy about? It's two people standing back to back in a picture. Yeah, and that's all you see is two people. I, I'm, I'm confused on what you would like me to, to speak I on in that I don't sense. think you are. Well, I'm confused. Are you trying to get me to say that there are two different races in this picture? Yes, is that I what you want you me to say? That. Well, at the end of the day, wouldn't that just be feeding into the problem of looking at race instead of just acknowledging them as two normal people? No, it's not because you you can't not look at you can't like, you can't look at people and not acknowledge that there are racial differences, right? But if we're going for, let's say if we're looking for equality within all this, then why would we need to point out things such as that? Because those things, those differences are real things. Those differences are real things, says the eugenicist teaching your children. Margaret Sanger trained this public school teacher, this white school teacher, very well. Keep up with what's trending. Subscribe on YouTube today.
trending now on the Eric Metaxas Show. Uh, a few weeks ago, we had on the man who's going to be the next mayor of New York, Curtis Sliwa. Well, I thought, you know what? We've got some friends across the pond. Why don't we see if we can find out who's going to be the next mayor of London? We figured out who it is. I'm not kidding. His name is Lawrence Fox. Lawrence, welcome to the program. Hi, Eric. How are you doing? I'm good. You're hoarse from your first stump speech, aren't you? I am a bit. I was quite nervous doing my first stump speech, I have to say. If people don't know this. Listen, I have to frame this, and you can feel free to interrupt me. And I'm not, I'm not kidding. But I want people to understand that you're initially in your life, you're an actor. You're principally known as an actor. So people want to know, why did Lawrence Fox, the actor from the acting family, suddenly decide to go uh, into politics and to say, yes, I would like to run to be the mayor of London. I mean, again, remember that most of the audience is American. They cannot fathom what's going on in London. So give us an idea for those of us who are not following the horrors of what your current mayor is doing. Yeah, we'll get on to my current mayor. He's dreadful. I think the reason why I'm not acting now is because about a year and a a year and a couple of months ago, I did. I went on a TV show in England called Question Time. I went on that show and um, I got into, into an argument with someone who said that I wasn't allowed a view because of my white privilege. And I said, let's not be racist to each other. That went down pretty badly. Um, so my show business career ended pretty quickly after that with the Actors Union in, in the UK calling for me to be denounced. Um, because I berated a woman of color. Keep up with what's trending. Subscribe on YouTube today. Trending now on The Mike Gallagher Show. The Delta found out that the Georgia skies aren't so friendly to woke companies. And the takeaway from what's happening with Delta and Coca-Cola and Home Depot, and and these are Georgia companies that are absolutely terrified of the Twitter mob. That's all it is. They, they, They haven't bothered to read the Georgia election integrity law because they don't care. What's in the law doesn't, truth doesn't matter to them. They just don't want to be hounded by a bunch of angry leftists who are in mama's bedroom, you know, a a basement in their underwear, furiously typing on their keyboards. So Missy writes, it's always nice when a progressive woke company that goes all political gets walloped with a face full of reality. And that's exactly what happened over at Delta. So for some reason, the Delta CEO issued a blistering statement condemning his company's home state and the efforts to have some voter integrity, some election integrity. I mean, among other things, the law requires voter ID even if you're voting by mail. Oh, heavens to Betsy, we can't have that. Delta called that voter suppression. Even though, of course, you you don't dare get on an airplane at Delta without showing your ID several times. Is that flying suppression or is that just common sense? Keep up with what's trending. Subscribe on YouTube today. Trending now on the Dennis Prager Show. It it is a force of pure destruction. If it's good, the left destroys it. America was largely good. America is composed of 330 million flawed human beings. It is amazing that it got as good as it did. The amazing thing is not the bad that exists, which is universal. The amazing thing is the good that exists, which is unique or extremely rare. You don't judge people by the same flaws, or you don't judge a society by the same flaws that every other one has. You judge it by what makes it exceptional, either worse, like a communist or fascist or Nazi country, or better, like America. A 
of a particular love of classical music, as you know. You know who love classical music the most, by far, certainly in the young generation, are Asians, Koreans, Chinese, and Japanese in particular. If you look at European orchestras, there are so many Asian players. The, the non-West may save the West. I'll tell you who may save Catholicism, and maybe all of Christianity, is, are Africans. Keep up with what's trending. Subscribe on YouTube today. Trending now on The Larry Elder Show. Anger, all this energy, all this passion for a bill that they consider to be racist? Have they read it? Have they seen the Yale study that shows that despite the so-called voter suppression measures, hasn't affected the black vote at all? If anything, it might have encouraged blacks to vote even more, as if to say, oh, really, you're trying to suppress my vote? I'll show you. No evidence whatsoever that these alleged voter suppression measures are, in fact, suppressing the black vote. None. Moreover, as I've said, Poll after poll after poll over the years has shown that blacks support photo voter ID almost to the same degree as whites do. But here's what they're doing. They're characterizing the issue as they always do as one as an attack against black people. That way, blacks remain eternally angry. The Democrats continue their image as the party of Morning, glory, America. Bonjour. Hi, Canada. Hugh Hewitt on a Tuesday. <clears throat> that means Byron York of the Washington Examiner joins me. Follow him on Twitter at Byron York. Watch him on Fox News. Good morning, Byron. Good morning, Hugh. You seemed in your newsletter to be awfully optimistic to me. Finally, some sanity on Georgia's voting law, question mark. Well, the answer is I don't yeah. think so. I, I really do not think so because uh, do you know what Rob Manfred belongs to? I have heard he belongs to Augusta National Golf Club. Yes, he does. Now, this is the uh, commissioner of Major League Baseball who pulled the All-Star game out of Atlanta because he didn't like the voting rights uh, bill. And he belongs to, I mean, if you are going to have, if you believed in white privilege and you are going to have a meeting of the white privilege society and you would gather at one place in the United States, where would you go, Byron York? <laughs> Uh, probably some exclusive neighborhood in Northwest Washington. Uh, well, that would that would be a good. But if you wanted to get away from Northwest Washington and you wanted no. to play some golf, <laughs> I know what you're trying to say. You'd go uh, to Augusta. Augusta is like the poster child for exclusive white male privilege, with a few women and minorities thrown in to get the corporate sponsors off their back. And Rob Manfred no. belongs to it. And you know and he's now also- reading. You think it's going to get better? It's going to get worse, Byron. Everyone's going to have to fight events. this out. Uh, I just, well, I, go ahead. Okay. Um, the reason I thought it might get better, I thought we have little green shoots of reason coming up, is that uh, I've seen a couple of discussions on the Internet in which people discuss the Georgia bill rationally, uh, people who have some objections to some uh, provisions of it, who think other provision, pr- provisions of it are good and think other provisions of it are completely, totally overhyped and not as important as they're presented to be. So I thought, well, that's huge progress. Now, the problem is the President of the United States, Joe Biden, is leading uh, the irrational forces here. And you have this uh, atmosphere of corporate fear that has has taken place, not just with what Major League Baseball did, but uh, Delta, Coca-Cola, two companies in Georgia, tons of other companies uh, feeling that they have to um, uh, be woke and issue a statement. I mean, United Airlines issued a statement on the importance of voting yesterday. And I'm thinking, 
Why? Why are they doing this? Who may, asked may, I, may I read that for, for the benefit of our audience? United sure, Airlines, right, right. 19 hours ago, put out this statement. Our mission is to connect people and unite the world. We believe that one of the most effective ways to do this is to engage in the democratic process, which begins with voting, a vital civic duty. America's democracy is stronger when we're all engaged and every vote is properly counted. Some have questioned the integrity of the nation's election systems and are using it to justify stricter voting procedures, even though numerous studies have found zero credible evidence of widespread fraud in U.S. elections. Legislation that infringes on the right to vote of fellow Americans is wrong. We believe that leaders in both parties should work to protect the right of eligible voters by making it easier and more convenient for them to cast a ballot and have it counted, which is what I think Georgia did. But, but my question is, what conceivable reason does United Airlines have to put this out? Their mission is to connect people and unite the world. No, their mission is to fly me from L.A. to D.C. And now I'm not going to get on United. I'm going to get on Alaska because I don't want to fly a Democratic airline. Well, you're going to run out of airlines at some point um, because you do have now Delta and United. Has American Airlines made a statement? I, I, that's a real question. I don't know. I don't know either. Um, but you, unite the world. Their their mission is to unite the world. Unite the world. What? Crazy sounding. <laughs> it's so crazy. <laughs> you know, anybody who got up on any television set in America and issued those words, my mission is to unite the world. You'd immediately start looking over at the stage manager and say, let's get this guy off of here. Right? You'd be this guy's mic. <laughs> yeah, cut this guy's mic. Our mission is to unite the world. Unite the world. It, who's running United okay, so, Airlines? Well, what, so you're, you're, what you're saying is there's something, <laughs> there's a weird malady of some sort running through corporate america yes and it is it is fear i mean i don't think there's any any doubt that uh, a lot of these executives they don't believe this stuff they they are afraid of something the, the woke mob some sort of repercussions if they don't get on board right now and that's what you're seeing operate that's what president biden is fueling he is stoking that fear with with what he said uh, about the georgia law about the the all-star game i mean really who cares that much about the baseball all-star game but it's become a huge uh a huge thing and the question is can corporate america get past its fear at some point and just stick to what they're doing you know shut up and fly or, Shut up and fly. You know, baseball, exactly. Byron, uh, this makes me sick to my stomach. I'm a hardcore Indians fan and have been since I was six. So I've been following them for 60 years, right? 60 years of Indians baseball can make you pretty indifferent to suffering because it's been mighty bad. They have not won a World Series in my lifetime. Uh, they, they last won it in 48. And I'm, I can't bring myself to even read this stuff. I will not buy a ticket this year. I will not buy any Tribe merch. I just won't because they're woke. And, and Rob Manfred, who probably is a nice guy and probably has never involved himself in le reading legislation in his life, somebody persuaded him he had to brand baseball as woke. And, and the same thing happened to United and Delta. And I don't know who's, who's advising these companies. This is for like the 1% of the craziest people in the country want them to do this. The rest of us just want to go from L.A. to Dulles. Well, they probably hired lots of fairly highly paid and inclusion uh, executives. So they've actually hired people to tell them this, who are telling them to read, I don't know, Ibram Max Kendi's books. They're telling them to read something. Um, and they're afraid of what is going on now, um, of facing a boycott, of facing some sort of adverse reaction if they're not on, on board. But if you yeah. walk into the middle of a gunfight in the old movies, the OK Corral, the undertaker would go into his store, right? All the merchants would close up for business. So saloon keeper yeah. would close the door. They'd get out of the way when the eight guys are in the street walking towards each other. So you don't run into the middle of the street and say, shoot me. You know, that's a good point. I haven't thought about shoot out the OK Corral in, yeah. in uh, relation to this. I've simply not thought about that. Um, but I, listen, 
one of the reasons my the the, the little green shoots that I was talking about. Uh, Politico playbook now a couple of days ago did um, a story about the dangers of overhyping uh, the election laws. Nate Cohn did a story in the New York Times about you know these laws don't really affect turnout that much. You can you can stay to pass laws for a long time concerning voting, and you can look at the results afterwards. And by the way, we know that, that turnout has been increasing um, quite a bit over the last several years. It's, it's the worst voter suppression in the world because turnout is it's at all-time high. So where did yeah. they move the, the All-Star game to? They moved it to the dope capital of the world. Moved it to Denver. Yeah, so you can get stoned and go to the game. And, and you can probably carry a gun. I don't know what the open carry laws are in Denver, but in Colorado, there's a lot of open carry. I do wonder now, Major League Baseball has taken this position. Why does it apply just to the All-Star game? I mean, it there doesn't. is a team in Georgia. There's a Major League Baseball team in Georgia. It has games that are scheduled in Atlanta, and all the other National League teams have games that are scheduled in Atlanta to play um, the Georgia football team, as we would call it in Washington. And, um, I, and, and I, I guarantee you, Byron, back to Augusta, you get the membership lift of Augusta and you begin to look at how many women are there and how many minorities. And you're going to be in single digits, single digits. So why is Rob well, you know, Manfred a member of Augusta? Yeah. It is a legitimate question. Well, it's a, it's a huge sports event taking place this week, by the way, the Masters in Georgia. Um, so, but and the Masters has been the target of protest in the past. Remember, they did not, many years ago, probably in the 90s, uh, they did not have any women members. Right. And they had they to let Condi Rice, who's a heck of a golfer. Condi Rice can beat most of the membership. She joined. And they probably have a few others. But it's not 50%. No. No. Good. Good Lord, no. Um, <laughs> so, and, and also, it, it doesn't matter. They're holding a sports event in Georgia. In Georgia. This week. And Rob Manfred belongs to it. And ABC is going to, or CBS is going to televise it. And the commissioner of football is going. And there will be United Airline hospitality tent there. I guarantee it. And 95% of the people playing golf are going to be white men. And there aren't going to be any women. What are they thinking? So, uh, Byron, your, your optimism is misplaced. Follow him at ByronYork on Twitter. Follow, follow me to the next segment. Trending now on The Larry Elder Show. You cease to amaze me is sometimes the stupidity that comes out of your mouth. The expression is never cease to amaze me as you're calling me stupid. Just, just, I'm just saying. About the George Floyd trial. Quite a Actually, it's the Derek Chauvin trial. George Floyd is dead. It's YouTube last so, year. As you call me stupid, just pointing out a few things. Yeah, they had white officers uh, uh, answering calls to white people. Two of them had knives. And in both instances, the officers took them down without any incident. Why don't you have your research staff research that sometimes before you go around flapping your gums about uh, flapping my gums is that racist it seems like uh you just on one side of the fence all the time the one that, that butters your bread i guess so you have a nice evening on one side of the fence all the time the one that butters your bread you have a nice evening i will say one more time sir the police kill every year more unarmed whites than they kill unarmed blacks heather mcdonald says that a black man is 18 and a half times more likely to kill a cop to kill a white cop than the other way around. Is that relevant to you? The number one cause of preventable death for young white men is accidents, car accidents, drownings, things like that. Number one cause of preventable death for young black men, homicide, almost always at the hands of another young black man. The percentage of blacks who are unarmed, killed by cops, represents roughly one third of 1% of all the blacks who are killed in this country every year. Is that at all relevant? Keep up with what's trending. Subscribe on YouTube today. Trending now on America First with Sebastian Gorka. 
even when they're not on some cable channel shock jock platform. They don't care. One of the bravest, best Americans I know was my colleague Sarah Huckabee Sanders. She's sitting there at the White House Correspondents Association annual dinner when somebody else who says she's a comedian, well, says this as she's standing next to her. Every time Sarah steps up to the podium, I get excited because I'm not really sure what we're going to get. You know, a press briefing, a bunch of lies, or divided into softball teams. <laughs> it's shirts and skins, and this time don't be such a little b Jim Acosta. <laughs> I actually really like Sarah. I think she's very resourceful. Like, she burns facts, and then she uses that ash to create a perfect smoky eye. <laughs> like, maybe she's born with it. Maybe it's lies. Probably lies. <laughs> and I'm never really sure what to call Sarah Huckabee Sanders. You know, is it Sarah Sanders? Is it Sarah Huckabee Sanders? Is it Cousin Huckabee? Is it Auntie Huckabee Sanders? Like, what's Uncle Tom but for white women who disappoint other white women? Hilarious, Michelle Wolf. So when that party, when those people, who voted for Joe Biden and for Hillary Clinton, tell you they care. They care about the illegal immigrants crossing our border. They're lying to you. They don't give a damn. Keep up with what's trending. Subscribe on YouTube today. Trending now on The Charlie Kirk Show. they are not insurgents and we are not being invaded which by the way is a white supremacist idea philosophy she doesn't know what philosophy means and that's okay she's she's not very bright she has a very big very substantial following i should say alexandria ocasio cortez is articulating why she's angry at the people that are angry that the left seems completely uninterested. Welcome back, America. I've been looking up Augusta National Golf Course, to which Major League Baseball Commissioner Rob Manfred belongs. Augusta National Golf Course integrated in 1990. They accepted a black member. They have 300 members at any given time. It costs between $100,000 and $300,000 to join, and the annual dues are at about $30,000 a year. Of course, this is all on Wikipedia, so it must be true. Um, is that not right, Generally, Simo? It's in Wikipedia. It's true. That's what they tell me. If it's on, right. if, if it's on the interwebs. It's, it's here. It's right in front of me. I want to read you the membership that they know of. Warren Buffett, just your average guy. Pete Kors, who I know, and Pete's wonderful. Pete's a good guy. Uh, former chairman and CEO of Coors Brewing. Bill Gates, another normal guy. Just running the Bill Gates all the time on the street. Lou Gerstner. Former IBM executive. He's like Rob Manfred. He's the kind of guy that gets the small locker at the end of the room. Roger Goodell, the big guy's big guy, right? Mr. NFL. Pat Hayden. So obviously, you don't have to go to college to belong to Augusta. He went to USC. Lou Holtz, America's favorite man, until he said something at President Trump's renomination convention, and then Lou got in trouble. Peyton Manning, America's favorite person. Tom Hanks and Peyton Manning, if they had a nice guy run off, it'd be a dead heat. Uh, the, the CEO of the Bank of America. Now there is Darla Moore, who is a South Carolina businesswoman. Jack Nicholas, America's favorite guy, number three. Sam Nunn, who I don't know how old Sam Nunn is, but he's still there playing golf at Augusta. Condi Rice, I told you, Secretary Rice is a member. James Robinson, the CEO of American Express. Uh, uh, Jeannie. Romney, who's the CEO of IPM, just normal people. 
There's the former CEO of uh, a railway company. Lynn Swan is in. One of their African-American, I don't know, they might have five members, I don't know. Rex Tillerson. He was, he was Secretary of State for a cup of coffee and didn't know what he was doing. If you read Josh Rogan's book, you'll figure out. Great oil executive. They asked him about China. He said, China ain't got no oil. He actually says, quoted in the book as saying that. China ain't got no oil. He doesn't know anything. David Farr, CEO of Emerson Electric. Normal people, right? That's Georgia. It is the original white male privilege bastion. And Rob Manfred, who is the commissioner of baseball who told Georgia's legislature that they were racist, goes to Georgia to play golf at Augusta. So there's a little inconsistency here. Now, Delta and United have declared themselves to be Democratic Airlines, and so has Major League Baseball become a Democratic sport. And who am I forgetting? It became a Democratic. Oh, Coca-Cola is a Democratic soft drink. Wall Street Journal, GOP sharpens criticism of corporate pushback on GOP voting laws. Uh, that means uh, Republicans ramp up attacks, according to the Washington Post, on corporations over Georgia voting law, threaten consequences. This is all very nice. The number one story of the day, China creates its own digital currency. Yes, indeed. They are reimagining Bitcoin as Chicom Bitcoin. So Chicom Bitcoin is coming. And that's going to take, I'm going to talk to Admiral Stavridis after the break about that. They flew 10 planes over Taiwan yesterday. They sent a carrier next to Okinawa. Uh, the CCP is on the march. And we're worried about Major League Baseball having the All-Star Game in Georgia. Makes a lot of sense. It absolutely makes total sense. What's going on in the markets today? Well, abroad. Let's check out abroad. Everything is good. Uh, France is up. Germany's up one and a quarter percent. England's up 1.2% because England's going to reopen. And that means the 10-year treasury is up to 1.72%. You need to go to andrewandtodd.com today. If you're going to buy a house and have some insurance against inflation, because they're not making any more land, if you got a house, if you own a land or an apartment building or a second house, your money is banked. You don't have to worry about inflation. If you get it at 3%, it's going to pay for itself when inflation arrives because the Democrats are going to print money. But to get a loan, you got to call 888 888-1172. Tell them Hugh Hewitt sent you. They'll take care of you at andrewandtodd.com. I was down there yesterday talking to all their loan officers. They're there waiting to help you. Go to andrewandtodd.com. Answer a couple of questions or call 888 888-1172. And come right back. Admiral Stav is next. Portions of the Hugh Hewitt Show brought to you by Sierra Pacific Mortgage. For more info, call 888-888-1172. Trending now on the Eric Metaxas Show. Uh, did you move to L.A. from New York? I moved very shortly out there after because while I couldn't write for Letterman, I was perfect for Johnny Carson. And so I asked my now friend, David Letterman, would he please send a package out to, to his connections? He's already been guest hosting that show for years right, and right. whatnot. So what happened? The Tonight Show said... Nah, we're not interested. Yeah, Johnny was going through a miserable divorce. Um, and, and by the way, I, I remember the very first joke because he did use some of the material I sent out. The very first joke. Now, you wouldn't be able to do this joke today because it's body shaming. And you have to remember the reference is, uh, I guess, now 35, maybe even gosh. Is this a Tony Fields joke or a Mama Cass Elliott joke? Sort of. Sort of. All right. Remember Karnak the Magnificent? The answer is, the answer is hip, hip, hooray. The question, describe Liz Taylor putting on her jeans. That is a great joke. What do you mean you can't do a joke like that today? That is a great joke. You just did it on this program. <laughs> I love it. Hip, hip. So has that right, joke so, ever appeared anywhere? Um, yes, every time I'm on the air. <laughs> every time you're on the air. Hip, hip, right. Well, when you write a joke like that, that's like a, I, I think um, Dick Cavett's first major joke was uh, uh, what, 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 uh, there's a new restaurant and it's uh, it's Chinese German. Uh, the only problem is an hour after you eat there, you're hungry for power. 
that's, uh, that's, yeah. that's a great joke. Yep. It's a stupid joke, but I mean, it's good. Anyway, okay, so hip, hip, hooray. Now, can, I, can I tell a, a, a slightly off-color joke? If you don't, we'll be offended. Keep up with what's trending. Subscribe on YouTube today. Trending now on The Mike Gallagher Show. Coca-Cola cowards read the damn bill. It doesn't suppress anybody unless you're of the mindset. You know, if you're black, you're too dumb to figure out how to get ID to vote. That's suppression because we know how black people are. You know how brown people are. They're not intelligent enough to get an ID put together. They can't go down to the DMV or they can't figure out a way to get just a state ID. They No, no, they can't. We can't expect our poor black friends to do that. That's the left. That's the mindset. That's the thinking of Democrats. Now, Ed Bastian's company, Delta, won't be so forgiving for somebody who's too ignorant to get an ID and let them get on their plane. Because you can't fly Delta without a photo ID, a legitimate ID. But don't you dare expect a black or brown Georgian to be smart enough to figure out how to produce an ID when they vote. That's suppression. No, that's not suppression. That's idiocy. That's, that, that is stupidity at the highest level, and everybody knows it. So good for the Georgia State Legislature for pushing back and, and telling Delta to go stick it in your ear. They ought to say the same thing. They ought to do the same thing to, to Coca-Cola, to Home Depot, to any of these companies who are playing this pitiful game of lying about the Georgia election integrity law. They are lies. Keep up with what's trending. Subscribe on YouTube today. Trending now on the Dennis Prager Show. Right now, uh, if it hasn't happened, it will happen. They will simply declare classics as an example of white supremacy. Absolutely. I think that is where we're headed. Um, and it's a shame because classics really taught me how to analytically think and critically think. And I think that's where I developed a lot of the foundation for being able to reason through things. And it's funny, I came out as a conservative um, maybe six or seven months ago. And a lot of people who had also studied classics, even though it's a small major at Cal, um, had reached out to me and said that they too were closet conservatives, um, which I thought was very interesting that maybe that major is producing some people who can think for themselves. <laughs> yeah, well, that, that's my old belief. Study Cicero <laughs> and think clearly. Absolutely. That's a major motto. Can you say that in Latin? <laughs> um, not, probably not. <laughs> <laughs> You say you came out as a conservative six months ago. Were you in the closet until then? Yeah, so I have always been politically inclined, and I went to Berkeley um, really not knowing what I believed. Um, and I quickly started to realize that um, I was right-leaning um, because everything was just, Welcome back, America. You hear what that music means? Admiral James Stavridis is with us, retired United States Navy Admiral, former Allied Supreme Commander of NATO. One of the best speakers I've ever heard. So if you're looking for someone to address you virtually or in person, you ought to go to... Uh, are you with Washington Speakers Bureau, Admiral? I am, Hugh. Washington Speakers Bureau, or just go to stavridis.com and you'll... Or Admiral Stav. A, a, what's your website? I forget every time. Admiral Stav. Dot com, S-T-A-B. That's pretty Admiral easy. Yeah. That's pretty easy. All right, two two stories for you, Admiral. 
10 Chinese military aircraft entered Taiwan, Taiwan's air defense identification zone on Monday, April 5, marking the third intrusion this month. That's story number one. Story number two, China sent an aircraft carrier and five escort ships, including a destroyer likened to the U.S. Navy's Aegis-class vessels, through the Mayaiko Strait near Okinawa over the weekend. What say you, Admiral? Uh, these are two interrelated stories. And even as we focus on China and its push against Taiwan, which of course is merely a follow-on to the uh, crackdown in Hong Kong, you've got to kind of think, well, what's the next step in the game? And it's not just the South China Sea, Hugh, it's the East China Sea. Uh, another body of water, uh, if you will, to the north of China. And of course, the press there is against Japan. So we see on the one hand, China flying very provocatively into the ADIS, in the air defense interrogation zone, identification zone. Um, that's directed against Taiwan. On the other hand, this carrier battle group, which is what we would call it in the U.S. Navy, is sailing in between uh, Japanese islands directed toward Japan. As you know, Japan and China have a significant dispute in the East China Sea over these Senkaku Islands, as the Japanese call them. Chinese call them the Daiyu Islands. Um, that is a second order challenge, but the two fit together as part of the ongoing Chinese maritime expansion of its power. They're demonstrating both to Taiwan and to Japan, uh, stand by, we own and operate in these waters. I want to pause for a moment on the Senkaku Islands because we're coming up on the 50th anniversary of the reversion of Okinawa to Japan, presided over by President Nixon this summer. When Okinawa reverted to Japan, so did the Senkaku Islands, though we did not sign anything saying so officially that was the intent. The People's Republic of China has exploited that ambiguity to say, oh, no, 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 they're in the nine dash line. They belong to us. No one actually is there. But when you were the uh, Supreme Allied Commander, was the Senkaku Island Japan's in your mind or did it was it un, was it disputed territory? What did you think about it when you were the boss? Uh, it's a 100 percent Japanese territory. And the U.S. has always stood behind that. There might have been some ambiguity 30 years ago about whether we considered them part of the treaty guarantee, whether we would, in effect, go to war if China invaded the Senkakus. Um, that ambiguity was ended uh, in the Obama administration and then in the Trump administration, both the two most recent presidents and now President Biden just several weeks ago, all three of the last American presidents, bipartisan, have said the Senkaku Islands are part of Japan, therefore they fall under our mutual defense treaty. That's a very big deal. The question is, these are nine really small little islands. Why the heck would China want them? And the answer is, as usual, oil, gas, fishing rights. If China owns them, they own 200 miles around them under the law of the sea for an exclusive economic zone. That's why China wants them. It's all part of the plan to consolidate the South China Sea and the East China Sea. I think I mentioned to you last week, a senior East Asian diplomat told me if they get Taiwan, Okinawa is next, but the stepping stones would be the Senkaku and that they might go for Senkaku first as a way of probing reaction on Taiwan. But I want to go back to these incursions. I can't do this story every week because people won't know what week it is. But I did it last week. I'm doing it again because the Chinese Communist Party, the People's Liberation Army Navy, they keep doing it in order to make it not a story. Right, Admiral? They're normalizing their behavior. To what end? Um, in order to be capable of having ships and aircraft forward in a response that um, makes us feel as though, as you just said, that's normal. Therefore, they can maintain these platforms forward. Therefore, when and if the moment comes when they decide to actually strike Taiwan, they'll have forces forward and we'll simply say up to that point, oh my gosh, that's kind of normal behavior for them. The danger here, obviously, is that we uh, lose our capacity to respond each and every time. When I say we, 
it's Taiwanese forces who have to do that, but U.S. forces who have to train, equip, help them with uh, responses, intelligence, oversight, um, all of that is something the United States should be doing, because if we don't do it, we're going to end up um, being very comfortable with Chinese forces operating extensively. That would put us way on the back foot in the case of uh, a significant conflict. And Admiral, I think that's much more difficult, is it not, than a static border like North Korea, South Korea. There you plant a thousand troops and they're a tripwire or East Germany, West Germany. Whenever there's a static border, it's pretty easy to decide whether or not your opponent, your enemy is violating it is North Korea will periodically over the decades send over 20 people and they have an ax wielding match at the border. We all know about it. I think the PRC is simply normalizing us so we do not notice when 10 becomes 20 and 20 becomes 40 and 40 becomes 100 and their ships are cruising between Okinawa and Japan. I mean, that was really startling to me. Indeed. And uh, let's reflect that it's also occurring in the Himalayas at the top of the world where um, not ax welding, but uh, knife wielding and club wielding Chinese soldiers are attacking Indian troops up there. Um, so this is really part of a Chinese strategy to show that they are assertive, that they will take what they believe is theirs um, and they will continue to push. This is why it's all the more important. We were talking about uh, Japan and the United States who have a mutual defense treaty. We also have one with Australia and it becomes very important to fold India into that arrangement. As you know, this is sometimes called the quad, not to be confused with the squad on Capitol Hill. The quad are the four nations, US, China, US Australia, uh, India, uh, and Australia who stand against China uh, with Japan. Oh, he froze up on me there, Admiral. Okay, there you are. You're, you're, you're kind of getting out a little bit. You've had a disturbance in the force in Florida. Did a hurricane hit? Are you back? There, you're Oops, back sorry. now. There you go. Yeah, the, the I, hope I, the... I hope I got you through got... the quad, the four nations that are working together. You did. Now, in 2034, your novel of the next war with China, you left Japan, Australia, and India. Well, you didn't leave India out of it, but you left Australia and Japan out of it. In reality, there's no leaving those three on the one side, right? They're all looking at the Taiwanese. They're all part of the same tapestry of movements. Are they coordinated in their response? Are their navies working together? They absolutely are. They work together annually in something called Operation Malabar, which is a series of exercises conducted in the Indian Ocean. Japan, Australia, United States, alongside India in the Indian Ocean. Um, that's an annual exercise. We're seeing more and more of that kind of exercising between these four navies. And the reason we left them out of the book, frankly, remember 2034 is a cautionary tale. And if we don't tend the garden of these alliances, they are gonna drift away from us. So part of the storyline is, how did we end up in 2034 without Japan, without Australia? Um, India is playing a very independent role. Um, we need to avoid that. That's part of the cautionary tale built into 2034. Do these other maritime powers run the same sort of thing we do, which is uh, uh, freedom of the sea missions where we penetrate beyond the nine dash line that doesn't exist, that is fake, but nevertheless, the Chinese declare it to be so. Do the, does Australia run its ships through there? Does Japan, does India? Um, so far, they have not joined officially as uh, stated members of the Freedom of Navigation Patrols. On the other hand, interestingly, our European allies have. The British, the French, even the Germans are conducting these Freedom of Navigation Patrols alongside us and declaring them Freedom of Navigation Patrols. In the good news category, the nations you mentioned, India, Australia, Japan, are operating their warships in and out. They're simply not formally stating, hey, this is a freedom of navigation patrol. But they regard the South China Sea, just as the United States does, as high seas, as international waters, where a warship can go, it can operate its aircraft, it can fire its guns, it can do whatever a warship needs or wants to do in international waters. So 
all of us pitching in together to make the point to China that you don't own this vast body of water. As you know, Hugh, the South China Sea is half the size of the United States of America. It's enormous. We can't just flip the car keys to the Chinese and say, yeah, you own it. Last question, Admiral. If you were up in D.C., I would ask you to walk down the hall at the Carlisle Group, where you were a uh, consulting member, and find Glenn Youngkin when he, well, he's running for governor right now, or somebody else, and ask them what this means. It's from the Financial Times today, and it says, China, Wall Street Journal, China creates its own digital currency, a first for a major economy. So they're going into the Bitcoin business. What's that tell you? Um, it tells me that uh, cryptocurrencies are edging closer and closer to becoming broadly regarded as investment vehicles. They're already used for payments. And what is next going to happen is sovereign nations are going to want to control it. And so I'd be cautious about over purchasing any cryptocurrency because at some point, sovereign nations are going to swoop in, take these things over, and they're going to be unintended, strange outcomes as a result of that. China's made the first move here. I think it will not be too long before you see the United States and other nations move in to try and regulate these cryptocurrencies. That's what I, I wanted to elicit from you without setting the table. They've done it. We have to do it, don't we? I think we do. And it's part of a larger uh, strategic move here is we need to have a national plan for artificial intelligence, cryptocurrency, cybersecurity. It's a big chunk of thinking that we have not done yet. We ought to have a future conversation about that. Admiral Stab, we will do so. Go to AdmiralStab.com, his best-selling novel, 2034, a, war, a book, a novel of the next war. Go and get it. Bestseller. Congratulations, Admiral. And I'll be right back, America. Don't go anywhere except here, ReliefFactor.com. Uh, every day I take it in the first hour, and I remind you right now, don't leave home without it. Put a bag in your car. I don't know how many practical tips I give you on this show. One is don't buy Bitcoin unless you understand it. <laughs> And unless you can afford to lose it, unless that happens, don't do it. But if that does happen, um, you want to uh, you want to understand why you lost all your money. Head over and get your Bitcoin. Uh, no, not your Bitcoin, your relieffactor.com at relieffactor.com. Uh, I don't think you can pay for it in Bitcoin. Cost $19.95. I don't know what percentage of a Bitcoin that is. What's a Bitcoin cost now, Dwayne? About a million dollars? I have no idea. Uh, but you can get Relief Factor, a three-week starter pack for $19.95. $19.95. Best deal in America. Go and get it. Make sure that you are on top of it. Do not leave home without it. Take it every single morning. I carry in Kirkman, Resveratrol, and Omega. Then come back. Uh, I'm going to talk with... Sun Min Kim next about the brand new authority of Chuck Schumer to spend as much money as he wants, as often as he wants. Stay tuned. Trending now on the Larry Elder Show. Biden makes these assertions about this Georgia law. says you can't give people water says it shrinks voting hours both of which are lies now as you know a man who now lives in Florida was dogged for four years with a running tab by one of the major newspapers about all the lies he tells Biden tells this big massive lies does them quietly doesn't scream or yell media doesn't say a damn thing now is that because the media doesn't know he's lying or doesn't care Biden said and Nancy Pelosi just reiterated it yesterday that 83 percent notice is never 82 never 84 it's always 83 83 percent of the Trump tax cuts went to the top one percent it's a lie factcheck.org says it's not true that's a left-wing organization run by the Annenberg uh, Foundation that's also left-wing the Annenberg Center PolitiFact also run by a left-wing organization said it's not true Washington Post the Washington Post as you know has not endorsed a Republican for president in its entire history that's how left-wing they are they said it's not true 
the left claim the top 1% are undertaxed. It's a lie. My point is, Biden says these things. Keep up with what's trending. Subscribe on YouTube today. Trending now on America First with Sebastian Gorka. I had a kind of epiphany today. Maybe I'm a big softy deep down. If you believe that, I got a bridge to sell you. But sometimes, especially, let me get personal. Not when I get attacked, but even then, when it's really vituperative, when it's really despicable, I have a certain feeling. But when they attack my family, and when they've attacked my children, there's usually a point in the year where I just find myself asking a certain question, a very human question. Why do they do that? Why would you do that to a fellow human being? And it puzzles me because I could never do that. I can be harsh. I can be very robust in what I say. Some would say aggressive. But it's not because I detest and wish to destroy human beings. I'm a rational human, and I can separate the person Welcome back, America. I'm Hugh Hewitt. There are some stories which are easy to understand. Derek Chauvin, quote, absolutely violated Minneapolis Police Department policies, according to the Minneapolis Police Department head yesterday. That's easy to understand. What's hard to understand are the stories where we bring in Sung Min Kim from the Washington Post. The one about the Senate parliamentarian ruling in favor of the Senate majority leader to change reconciliation rules. Sung Min Kim, you get to explain that to six million people. Go ahead. <laughs> Hi, thanks for having me, Hugh. Good morning. So basically, what uh, what we understand the Senate parliamentarian ruling to be is that you can basically revise the budget resolution that the Senate and the and the House has already passed to use reconciliation again. Um, that seems to be the interpretation from Elizabeth McDonough. Uh, what I think was really, it, it, which has significant implications, because that means there are more times when the Senate can pass legislation with just a simple majority of votes rather than 60 votes that most legislation requires. So if if the interpretation is all correct, that is a big deal for Biden, that's a big deal for uh, Senate Majority Leader Schumer. Um, but one thing to remember in, uh, in all of this is this phrase in uh, the, spoke, uh, the Schumer spokesman statement yesterday, where he said that there are still some parameters that need to be worked out. So that, to me, is kind of like this big asterisk, and I want to know what those uh, parameters are that would allow um, reconciliation uh, to be used again uh, to pass legislation, because it's not necessarily just this big $2.25 trillion infrastructure bill that Democrats want to pass rapidly, that's not likely to get uh, Republican votes. There's also the so-called human infrastructure plan that the Biden administration has, uh, has indicated they will roll out uh, later this month. And there's also uh, there's a lot of agitation among advocacy groups to use immigration um, under reconciliation. So it'll be really interesting and really uh, important to see that fine print of the parliamentarian ruling uh, in the coming days. Now, the parliamentarian the last time around ruled that the minimum wage could not be attached to reconciliation. And reconciliation just been seeming a category of laws that have to do with raising taxes and spending money. That's what reconciliation, there's a category of laws not subject to the filibuster, and it happens usually once a year. And that once a year includes a votorama, it includes two votoramas, actually. It's kind of an exhausting process. And I expected to have two reconciliations, and that's usually pretty hard to muster everyone's attention span. At the end of the day, I think this means that if they stay within whatever those parameters are, they can do it as often as they want. It also means that when the Republicans get back the presidency, the Senate and the House, 
they can do so as well, Sung Min Kim. That's what the right. untold story is. It's one set of rules. Once you change the rules, Harry Reid found out, they changed the rules for Mitch McConnell, and he was much more disciplined about it when it came to judges. Right, right. I mean, that's just how the Senate works. It, it's, a, it's a chamber that operates on precedent. So once you change the precedent uh, when it comes to legislation, budget bills, nominations, then future, future majorities can certainly take advantage of that. Um, and you saw how that worked. You know, most notably when, uh, when you know, as you just discussed, uh, Harry Reid went nuclear on most nominations in 2013, and Republicans took advantage of that once they took back, once uh, they took back the majority, and came back in the majority in early 2015. So it is, um, it is certainly something that Republicans are watching to see what they can do um, if and when they return to the majority in subsequent elections. Now, my question to you, you're a veteran of both the White House and the Senate. Joe Manchin has said he's not for a 28 percent corporate tax cut. He's only go up to 25 percent. So that's the limit. Where are the other Democrats? Kristen Sinema is often mentioned as being a moderate, which uh, kind of surprises me, but maybe she is. I expect Angus King is kind of a moderate because he was a governor. He knows you just can't print money endlessly. Who else is a moderate in that caucus? Often Chris Coons was thought to be. He is on international security affairs and human rights. But where are the other fiscal, quote, moderates in the Democratic caucus? Chris Coons is uh, definitely has been considered a moderate. But remember, his new role right now is uh, Biden's top ally in the Senate. Um, he's right. so close to the president. So he's going to be a chief kind of strategist for the president of sorts on Capitol Hill and kind of helping to push his agenda through. But you should also remember um, Senator Mark Warner of Virginia. That's another kind of uh, person to watch in the in the mod squad, if you will. And he actually told reporters yesterday on Capitol Hill that he has raised some concerns about the infrastructure package uh, to the White House. He hasn't he did not lie for reporters what exactly those concerns were, were, but we could imagine that perhaps he believes the corporate tax rate is going back up too high and perhaps is seeking for another, seeking a lower figure or that he is worried about the level of spending, even if it is offset by tax hikes. So that's, he's definitely another person to watch um, in the coming. Uh, what about Maggie Hassan, who has to run against maybe Chris Sununu in tax uh, hating New Hampshire? Is she one of those? That, Maggie Hassan is definitely another person to watch. She's in that group of 20, uh, rep Repub 10 Republican, 10 Democratic senators seeking a compromise. So she's definitely someone to watch as well. Uh, we'll keep watching your byline. Sung Min Kim of the Washington Post. Thank you. I'm coming right back, America. Don't go anywhere. Tom Cotton joins me in the next hour. Don't miss that. Portions of the Hugh Hewitt Show brought to you by Sierra Pacific Mortgage. For more info, call 888-888-1172. Trending now on The Charlie Kirk Show. This is a teacher-student dialogue of a Zoom class in Virginia. Listen carefully. Play tape. Tell me what, what this seems to be a picture of. It's just two people chilling. Right, just two people. <laughs> That's nothing more to this picture? No, nah, not really. Just two people chilling. I don't believe that you believe that. Um, I don't believe that you look at this as just two people. Um, I don't think truly you is just two people, though, two people. Is it not? Yeah, but I think you're being. I think you're being. Um, I think you're being intentionally coy about what this is a picture of. <laughs> what would I be being coy about? It's two people standing back to back in a picture. Yeah, and that's all you see is two people. I, I'm I'm confused on what you would like me to to speak I don't, on. In that I don't sense. think you are. Well, I'm confused. Are you trying to get me to say that there are two different races in this picture? Yes, Is that I what you want me to say? say? Well, at the end of the day, wouldn't that just be feeding into the problem of looking at race instead of just acknowledging them as two normal people? No, it's not because you you can't not look at you can't like, you can't look at people and not acknowledge that there are racial differences, right? 
But if we're going for, let's say if we're looking for equality within all this, then why would we need to point out things such as that? Because those things, those differences are real things. Those differences are real things, says the eugenicist teaching your children. Margaret Sanger trained this public school teacher, this white school teacher, very well. Keep up with what's trending. Subscribe on YouTube today. Trending now.
Morning, Glory America. Bonjour. Hi, Canada. Hugh Hewitt. Glad to have you with me this morning. Uh, I think you know that I believe that the purpose of life is to be happy, and uh, that's best achieved by a good relationship with God, but many people can define their own happiness, whatever they want. It usually doesn't include being sick or dead. And so I'm a big proponent of getting vaccinated because yesterday in the United States, 383 people died of COVID-related illness. COVID was a comorbidity, meaning that but for COVID, they would have been alive. That's down from January 20th when 4,396 people died. So we've done pretty well. We're pushing down the number of deaths in the United States because of COVID. Uh, and that's good. The reason we are doing that is because we've improved therapeutics. All right, so we have got a lot better way to treat people. We're figuring out things like ivermectin might work very well. We're figuring out therapeutics that remdesivir and other things work. But the best thing is not to get it at all, right? So not to get it all means getting a vaccination. And in the United States, we're doing pretty well with that. We vaccinated 107 million people have got at least one shot. That's 32.4% of America. And 18% of America, including yours truly, have had two shots in two weeks, meaning we've got as much, uh, as much immunity as possible. So I'm jumping on an airplane Saturday. I'm not flying woke. I'm not flying on Delta and I'm not flying on United. I won't fly woke if I have a choice. I'll fly woke if I have to fly woke, but I'd rather fly normal because if an airline is too busy worrying about how they appear on social media. They're not fixing the wheels and the, they're not maintaining the service and they're not making sure that I get from A to B. So I'm not flying woke this weekend and I hope you don't fly woke either. And I'm not watching, I, I really, I have not sworn off baseball. I just can't get over it yet. I'm not gonna buy any tickets and I'm not gonna buy any merch, but I just don't care. I mean, Rob Manfred really broke the sport for me because it wasn't, sport is supposed to be about sport. I'm going to have to wait for football and hope that, you know, I, I never got upset when players knelt football. That's an individual freedom. But baseball declared itself woke this week. And I'm waiting for Rob Manfred to come out today and say he's not going to Augusta because he's newly woke and he's not going to Georgia because Georgia is a bad place. And Augusta, which is like the birthplace of white privilege, he's not going to go to Augusta. And it's a male privilege me too place and he's not going to go there. And he's not going to put up with tokenism in Major League Baseball. I mean, the number of <clears throat> players who are minority in Major League Baseball, I don't know what the percentage is, but it's a lot. A lot of Latinos, a lot of African Americans, not many women playing baseball as far as we know, but they've got women umpires and they're doing their best. But Augusta is really the most retro place in the world. So Rob Manfred, the commissioner of baseball who pulled the All-Star game out of Georgia, he really can't go to Augusta. He should resign his membership. So I'm waiting on that. But in the meantime, while we wait for woke developments, this is a very unwoke thing for me to say. Get vaccinated because you don't want to die. Now that you say, oh, well, I, I, I know there are some skeptics out there. This is not rocket science. 383 people died yesterday. 4,308 people died on January 20th. What's the difference? Vaccination. Vaccination are killing off the target population. It's not spreading as far and as fast. We're going to get to herd immunity after another month or so, and you need to get vaccinated. And some of you are reading weird stuff. Some of you are going into the internet and you've educated yourself, which is always kind of dangerous. Uh, and you think you've read somewhere that it changes your DNA and gives you a sixth finger. That's not true. And your head begins to swivel around and you, uh, you expel green stuff. That's not true. It's just a vaccination like the polio vaccine, like the measles vaccine. It's good for you. Don't become an anti-vaxxer. They are not science people. They are crazy people. They live in fear. Live in hope, live happy, and live long. Get your three score in 10 years. You're actually three score in 18 years is the average lifespan. Don't die on a ventilator. Don't die alone in a hospital. Just go get vaccinated. Now it is not, it's run by the government. So it is not the easiest thing in the world to run. But you can try the private sector things, which brings me to Ron DeSantis. They tried to take out Ron, you know, Ron DeSantis is the least woke governor in America. And so the media hates him. He's also among the likeliest of people to be president after Joe Biden stops being not president. Uh, that means in 2024, uh, the front runners are Ron DeSantis, Mike Pompeo, and Tom Cotton. 
They just are. They're the three most Trump people not named Trump. And those are the three most likely people to be president. And so they're going to methodically go after each of them. We're going to talk to Tom Cotton at the bottom of the hour. And they're going after Ron DeSantis, allegedly because he did a deal. Well, let's play the let's play the 60 minutes cut. I don't have my cut sheet in front of me. Dwayne wouldn't send it to me today. But I have a cut of 60 minutes going after Ron DeSantis on uh, Sunday night. Can we play that? We can't find it, can we? Yeah, it's it. We're, Oh, it's frozen. We wanted to ask Governor DeSantis about the deal, but he declined our request for an interview. We caught up with him south of Orlando. Publix, as you know, donated $100,000 to your campaign, and then you rewarded them with the exclusive rights to distribute the vaccination in So Palm first Beach. of all, that, what you're saying is wrong. How, how is that not pay to that, play? That's a fake narrative. I met with the county mayor. I met with the administrator. I met with all the folks at Palm Beach County, and I said, Here's some of the options. We can do more drive-through sites. We can give more to hospitals. We can do the Publix. And they said, we think that would be the easiest thing for our residents. So but Melissa that. McKinley, the county commissioner in the Glades, told us the governor never met with her about the Publix deal. The criticism is that it's pay to play, and it's governor. wrong, it's wrong, it's a fake narrative. I just disabused you of the narrative and you don't care about the facts because obviously I laid it out for you in a way that is irrefutable. Well, I, I and so it's clearly not. Isn't there the nearest no, public? No, 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 you're wrong, you're wrong, away. you're wrong. Yes, That's sir. That's actually a fact. The, uh, the CBS reporter, whose name I do not know, uh, is manipulated by her producer that wants to make a headline. They want to make Ron DeSantis a pay-to-play governor. And Publix, if you don't know, is a grocery store, as far as I can tell. I'm not a Florida guy, so I don't know. Uh, and there are lots of them, and they decided to give out the vaccine through Publix. It's working well. So they developed a premise. Publix gave Ron DeSantis $100,000 for his campaign. So let's make Ron DeSantis a bad guy and prove that he gave Publix the uh, opportunity to distribute the vaccine in order to, to pay back his contributor. Now, number one, $100,000 is nothing in a Florida campaign. It just is nothing. Number two, here's his real answer, which CBS 60 Minutes did not play for you. So first of all, that, what you're saying is wrong. That's, that, that's a fake narrative. So first of all, when we did the, the first pharmacies that had it were CVS and Walgreens, and they had a long-term care mission. So they were going to the long-term care facilities. They got vaccine in the middle of December. They started going to the long-term care facilities the third week of December to do LTCs. So that was their mission. That was very important, and we trusted them to do that. As we got into January, we wanted to expand the distribution points. So yes, you had the counties, you had some drive through sites, you had hospitals that were doing a lot, but we wanted to get it into communities more. So we reached out to other retail pharmacies, Publix, Walmart, obviously CVS and Walgreens had to finish that mission. And we said, we're gonna, we're gonna use you as soon as you're done with that. For the Publix, they were the first one to raise their hand, say they were ready to go. And you know what? We did it on a trial basis. I had three counties. I actually showed up that weekend and talked to seniors across four different publics. How was the experience? Is this good? Should you think this is the way to go? And it was 100% positive. So we expanded it and then folks liked it. And I can tell you, if you look at a place like Palm Beach County, they were kind of struggling at first in terms of the senior numbers. I went, I met with the county mayor, I met with the administrator, I met with all the folks at Palm Beach County and I said, Here's some of the options. We can do more drive through sites. We can give more to hospitals. We can do the Publix. We can do this. They calculated that 90% of their seniors live within a mile and a half of a Publix. And they said, we think that would be the easiest thing for our residents. So we did that. And what ended up happening was you had 65 Publix in Palm Beach. Palm Beach is one of the biggest counties, one of the most elderly counties. We've done almost 75% of the seniors in Palm Beach. And the reason is because you have the strong retail footprint. So our uh, way has been multifaceted. It has worked. And we're also now very much expanding CVS and Walgreens now that they've completed the long-term care mission. Yes. And it's wrong. It's wrong. It's a fake narrative. I just disabused you of the narrative. And you don't care about the facts because obviously I laid it out for you in a way that is irrefutable. And so it's clearly not. No, 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 you're wrong. You're wrong. You see, uh, Harvard Law School teaches you how to argue. That's why Tom Cotton, Mike Pompeo and Ron DeSantis are 
the uh, leading candidates for president because Harvard Law School teaches you how to take CBS apart. CNN, 60 Minutes faces backlash. New York Post, Democratic Florida mayor slams 60 Minutes. I just wish Piggly Wiggly had been what they used because if I could have heard Ron DeSantis say Piggly Wiggly 10 times or CBS say Piggly Wiggly 10 times, and if you don't know what Piggly Wiggly is, you've never been to South Carolina, but I, wouldn't it have been great if he'd done the deal with Piggly Wiggly? That would have been better. CBS, what a bunch of liars at 60 Minutes. I'll be right back on The Hugh Hewitt Show.
Welcome back, America. It's Hugh Hewitt. Thanks for listening. Stephen in Florida, 1-800-520-1234. Good morning, Stephen. Are there piggly wigglies in Florida? There may be some in North Florida up around Santa Rosa County or so, maybe near the Georgia border, but not down where I'm at. It's mostly yeah. public. Yeah, and a couple you know, of Dixies here and there. It would have been so much better if Ron DeSantis had done a deal with Piggly Wiggly <laughs> and CBS had to say Piggly Wiggly 10 times or so. That would have been amusing as opposed to merely appalling. <laughs> yeah, it would have been very funny to hear uh, their, their uh, Piggly Wiggly comments. <laughs> <laughs> so, Ron DeSantis, they've turned Ron DeSantis into a giant, you know, to be attacked by CBS without effect, to survive the 60 Minutes hit job. I've always told everyone who's ever asked me, never, ever sit down with 60 Minutes. They cheat, they lie, they edit. And President uh -huh. Nixon taught me that in the 70s. He would never talk to 60 Minutes because they edited it. Mike Wallace always cheated. So why in the world does anyone do an interview? So 60 Minutes shows up and they actually are so dumb. They try and make Ron DeSantis look bad with edited tape, as though the rest of the country, there were other reporters there. They can't get away with that stuff. No. And living in Florida, I know for a fact, the whole Walgreens CBS thing, that, is, that has been going on for months with them hitting those long-term care facilities. But not only that, uh, just a, a, a mile or so from my house, there are three elderly home communities, these uh, trailer parks, you know, for, for the elderly, these retirement communities. And they had pop-up sites in there, and CVS and, and Walgreens were, you know, doing some work inside of those communities as well. Yeah. Ron DeSantis has done a wonderful job rolling out the vaccine to the people most at risk, those over the age of 65. End of story. 60 Minutes wanted to take a bite out of him. Instead, they made him yeah. bigger. Thank you, Stephen. Let me check markets brought to you by Andrew and Todd.com. They're listening closely today because I was down there yesterday and they were all practicing their golf swing. I'm really, they were all just out there in the front of the building with their wedges and they were chipping it. Now that's not true. I have never seen that many people working that hard. And that's because right now America is refinancing and they should because if you have a home and your home has a mortgage, you have an opportunity to lower that mortgage significantly if you go through with a refinancing. And people don't like to do it. It's like going to the dentist. Uh, and there's no getting around it. Nobody likes to get their W-2s together and send their tax forms into the very secure andrewandtodd.com. They're with Sierra Pacific Mortgage. They protect your documents. They protect your information. You call them at 888-888-1172. And I saw Todd Avakian and I saw Andrew Del Rey and I met with the whole team again yesterday. Walked around, chatted up with everyone. And they, they didn't really want to talk to me too much. They all wanted to get back to work. Because everybody wants to get done now before the de Democrats spend another $5 trillion and interest rates go up some more. So don't wait another day. Go to andrewandtodd.com. Everything is up in Europe this morning. France, Germany, England, all up. Japan up. China up. Hong Kong up. Excuse me. Japan went down. Everybody else is up. And I expect there will be a good day on the market. We never know in the morning. You can't say anything about the American market until 4 p.m. in the afternoon. And I am myself a morning show. And so I can tell you what happened yesterday. Everything was great yesterday. The Dow went up 373 points yesterday. The S&P went up 58. The Nasdaq went up 225. But I don't know what's going to happen today. All I know is that Chuck Schumer is going to spend more money and eventually interest rates are going to go up. So you need to call Andrew and Todd at 888 today. Another Steve somewhere else in Florida. Hello, Steve. Hello, you. They're neglecting to mention that there's a pharmacy in each Publix. So they were in competition with the other locations and the other pharmacies. Of course there is. They, they, of well, course there is. There's no story. It's completely made up. But I w do, is there a Piggly Wiggly near you, Steve? No, no, there's not. There's, uh, there's Winn-Dixie, though, if that, if that tickles your fancy. No, nah, Winn-Dixie didn't have the same sort of allure that saying Piggly Wiggly 20 times in a CBS 60 Minutes hit piece would. I mean, well, that... at any rate, they're, make, they're making it out like a grocery store. It's the it's the pharmacy. I, I I'm in and out of Publix every day. I, I, it's it's a, yes, I know. It's it's like there's a uh, grocery store. There's a pharmacy in every uh, Albertsons and Ralph Abeda or whatever is the gross. I don't do grocery shopping. Walmart. Uh, I don't think Trader Joe's has a pharmacy yet, but everybody else does. I'll bet you Arkansas has Piggly Wigglies. We'll find out with Tom Cotton next on the Hugh Hewitt Show.
Don't forget to sign up for The Huniverse, all of Hugh's broadcasts on demand, The After Show, which in my opinion is worth the price all by itself, Dwayne FM, and all sorts of bonus content. www.huniverse.com Trending now on The Charlie Kirk Show. This is a teacher-student dialogue of a Zoom class in Virginia. Listen carefully. Play tape. What this seems to be a picture of. It's just two people chilling. Right, just two people. That's nothing more to this picture? Nah, not really. Just two people chilling. I don't believe that you believe that. Um, I don't believe that you look at this as just two people. Um, I don't think truly it's just, just two people, people though, is it not? Yeah, but I think you're being, I think you're being, um, I think you're being intentionally coy about what this is a picture of. <laughs> what are you being coy about? It's two people standing back to back in a picture. Yeah, and that's all you see is two people. I, I'm, I'm confused on what you would like me to, to speak on. I don't, on in that I don't sense. think you are. Well, I'm confused. Are you trying to get me to say that there are two different races in this picture? Yes, is that I what you want me to, to say? That. Well, at the end of the day, wouldn't that just be feeding into the problem of looking at race instead of just acknowledging them as two normal people? No, it's not because you you can't not look at you can't like, you can't look at people and not acknowledge that there are racial differences, right? But if we're going for, let's say if we're looking for equality within all this, then why would we need to point out things such as that? Because those things, those differences are real things. Those differences are real things, says the eugenicist teaching your children. Margaret Sanger trained this public school teacher, this white school teacher, very well. Keep up with what's trending. Subscribe on YouTube today. Trending now on the Eric Metaxas Show. Uh, a few weeks ago, we had on the man who's going to be the next mayor of New York, Curtis Sliwa. Well, I thought, you know what? We've got some friends across the pond. Why don't we see if we can find out who's going to be the next mayor of London? We figured out who it is. I'm not kidding. His name is Lawrence Fox. Lawrence, welcome to the program. Hi, Eric. How are you doing? I'm good. You're hoarse from your first stump speech, aren't you? I am a bit. I was quite nervous doing my first stump speech, I have to say. If people don't know this. Te listen, I have to frame this, and you can feel free to interrupt me. And I'm not, I'm not kidding, but I want people to understand that you're initially in your life, you're an actor. You're principally known as an actor. So people want to know, why did Lawrence Fox, the actor from the acting family, suddenly decide to go... Uh, into politics and to say, yes, I would like to run to be the mayor of London. I mean, again, remember that most of the audience is American. They cannot fathom what's going on in London. So give us an idea for those of us who are not following the horrors of what your current mayor is doing. Yeah, we'll get on to my current mayor. He's dreadful. I think the reason why I'm not acting now is because about a year and a a year and a couple of months ago, I did. I went on a TV show in England called Question Time. I went on that show and um, I got into, into an argument with someone who said that I wasn't allowed a view because of my white privilege. And I said, let's not be racist to each other. That went down pretty badly. Um, so my show business career ended pretty quickly after that with the Actors Union in, in the UK calling for me to be denounced. Um, because I berated a woman of color. Keep up with what's trending. Subscribe on YouTube today. Trending now on the Mike Gallagher Show. The Delta found out that the Georgia skies aren't so friendly to woke companies. And the takeaway from what's happening with Delta and Coca Cola and Home Depot, and, and these are Georgia companies that are absolutely terrified of the Twitter mob. That's all it is. They, they, they haven't bothered to read the Georgia election integrity law because they don't care. What's in the law, doesn't. truth doesn't matter to them. They just don't want to be hounded by a bunch of angry leftists. 
who are in mama's bedroom, you know, bath, a, a basement in their underwear, furiously typing on their keyboards. So Missy writes, it's always nice when a progressive woke company that goes all political gets walloped with a face full of reality. And that's exactly what happened over at Delta. So for some reason, the Delta CEO issued a blistering statement condemning his company's home state and the efforts to have some voter integrity, some election integrity. I mean, among other things, the law requires voter ID even if you're voting by mail. Oh, heavens to Betsy, we can't have that. Delta called that voter suppression, even though, of course, Welcome back, America. It's Hugh Hewitt, joined by United States Senator Tom Cotton. Good morning, Senator. How are you? Good morning to you. It's good to be on with you. I hope the Hewitt family and all of your listeners had a blessed Easter weekend. We did indeed, and and they're mourning at Gonzaga, but they're celebrating throughout Texas this morning. Never, ever, uh, Senator Cotton, let yourself get on the cover of Sports Illustrated. Will you promise me that? (laughs) I don't think with my sports abilities these days, I'm at risk of being on the cover of any sporting magazine. Yeah, you and me both. I got it. By the way, speaking of sports, um, if you had to name the least woke place in America, wouldn't it be Augusta National Golf Course? <laughs> well, that's only if Rob Manfred does what uh, he should do if he wants to stick by his virtue signaling via his job, which is not only refuse to attend the Masters tournament this week, but uh, also uh, resign his membership at Augusta to continue his boycott of Georgia and, frankly, encourage Augusta to replace him with a woman or a minority. Now, something Absolutely. Tells you, something Absolutely. Something tells you that Rob Manford, Rob Manford will be a little more uh, discerning and a, a little more um, deliberate when it comes to his own uh, preferences and his own comforts and his own prestige with his membership at Augusta than he was with the institution he leads, Major League Baseball. Yeah, they've also gone to the dub capital of the world. They have moved uh, the Major League Baseball to Colorado, which they think of as woke because of their dope policy. But I don't think he's looked at their open carry laws in in Colorado much. The anti-gun people are not going to like that one. I mean, you can't (laughs) win with woke. Well, also, Hugh, um, so it is true that Colorado is a very strong second in the state. Uh, But also, if I'm not mistaken, Hugh, I think it takes a photo ID to vote in person in Colorado. It Uh, does. I don't know what... I don't know what version of Jim Crow this is, but, you know, according to Joe Biden and Stacey Abrams, Georgia is responsible for Jim Crow 2.0. So I think Delaware, Joe Biden's state, must be Jim Crow 3.0 since they don't have uh, any early voting and they get many fewer drop boxes than Georgia does now. Uh, and I think they require photo ID. So I guess Colorado would be Jim Crow 4.0 by the Democrats' ridiculous standards. It is. And I noticed that the leader, McConnell, and other Republicans are out there saying, this isn't going to fly. We Corporate America and United Airlines went woke today, too. I don't know what's up with United Airlines. I don't boycott people. I just make choices when I can make. I don't have to buy Major League Baseball tickets and equipment I'm, and merch. I'm not going to. I don't have to fly Delta except in rare cases. I'm not going to. I'm going to fly a different. I, I, you know, that just impacts my choice. And it's too bad because most people I know working for the airlines, the pilots and the stewards, they are very center right. I mean, I get yeah. so many people talking to me on airlines. I do not know what's going on at headquarters, but it is not the people who, who fly and attend to me on the airplane. So, Hugh, Hugh, I think there's a couple things going on with these politically correct corporations and CEOs. Um, one is they're responding to their fears. A lot of these companies, I would point out, have deep ties to the Chinese Communist Party because they want access to Chinese market or they want to outsource jobs there. So Delta is uh, in partnership with a Chinese communist owned airline and Coca-Cola of all things was aggressively lobbying uh, last year in Congress against a bill to punish uh, China for its use of slave labor by religious minorities. And Major League Baseball is increasingly entwined with the communist regime in China and of course has long been entwined with the communist regime in Cuba. And they're scared of those communists in those countries because they know that they will cut them off. I think they're also scared 
of um, the radical left-wing mobs in America because they know that those mobs, both inside their companies and outside their companies, will target them for campaigns of harassment and boycott and so forth. Um, so I, I think they're responding to their cowardly fears. Now, Hugh, one way to counteract that pressure inside these companies is for conservative employees to make their voices heard. As you said, there are thousands and thousands of conservative Republicans who work for Delta, American, and United. And I've met dozens of them over the years who have recognized me when I'm flying back and forth from Arkansas to Washington, gate agents, pilots, flight attendants. You know, they um, thank me for my service in the Senate. They said they support uh, what I'm trying to accomplish. They even, Hugh, committed what the left-wing mob would view as a cardinal sin of saying they supported Donald Trump as well. Yep. So these, C- these CEOs, you know, uh, like the Coke CEO and Delta CEO, sitting in their gleaming headquarters in Atlanta, surrounded by social justice MBAs straight out of the Ivy League, um, hear all the time from their left-wing employees. So if you're a mechanic at Delta or you're um, a factory worker at Coca-Cola, or you're a pilot at Delta, you should just send off an email. Send an email to your CEO. Send an email to your chief diversity officer and tell them what you think about these things. And more to the point, if you work at other companies that haven't taken these steps but are being pressured to take these steps, you should make your voice heard. Make sure that your CEO knows that he doesn't speak for all of his employees when he takes the far left position on these issues. Now, I'd like to suggest that you work with all, one of your old law professors. I know that Elizabeth Warren was your law professor, right? And she was a pretty good professor. And much better professor than she is a senator. I exactly. But, she'd, but, probably, but she, she'd probably say I was a much better student than I am a senator, and I wasn't but, a very good student to you. I'm sure that's a bit. But I mean, you do have the HLS together, and you ought to go down and sit down and talk about shareholder rights. And let's see if we can't get a, a, a suit available to shareholders who are looking at United today and seeing their very woke 2.0 statement about our mission is to unite the world. I thought their mission was to get me from L.A. to D.C., but they've expanded their mission to save the world. Can't you and Senator Warren sit down and write some shareholder protection against the politicization of corporate America? Well, I'm not sure that Liz Warren has much interest in protecting shareholders or anyone else who owns single assets. In America, if you look at some of the Democratic You're tax spending right. plans, but I, but I will I will say this to you that another point is, who cares what all these CEOs think? Who appointed them moral ob- arbiters um, of our political order? I mean, these CEOs run an airline, they sell sugary beverages, they run a credit card company, they run a drug company. They're not the Pope, they're not a bishop, they're not head of a uh, Protestant convention, they certainly didn't put their name on the ballot and ask their fellow citizens to elect them to help make laws to govern our country. They are business executives, and they have no special claim to knowledge or moral virtue any more than those mechanics or pilots or flight attendants or gate agents who are conservative Republicans. So how about they just stick to doing their job as opposed to expressing uninformed, politically correct decisions about how we should order political affairs in our country? Well, I, do, I agree with that. I also have a theory as to why they're acting this way, Senator. If you saw the 60 Minutes attempted hit on Ron DeSantis, another Harvard Law graduate, it teaches you, one, don't go after a Harvard Law graduate who's got the microphone. It also teaches you, number two, it would be better if Piggly Wiggly were in Florida because then it would have been funnier. Have you got Piggly Wiggly in Arkansas? <laughs> uh, we do have a few Piggly Wigglies, not many. It's, it's you know, Piggly Wiggly is more of a kind of a Southeast um, franchise. So in in the southern and eastern parts of Arkansas, we have a few. Wouldn't it have been um, great if the if the 60 Minutes reporter had said, we have a pay-for-play scandal involving Piggly Wiggly? It would have just been yeah. hilarious. But it would, Ron- have been, it, would have been amu- it would have been amusing to, yeah, here is some uh, um, 60 Minutes correspondents having to say Piggly Wiggly dozens of times over and over. I know. They were, they're so self-important. It was hilarious. And DeSantis took them apart with a scalpel, and then they ran it anyway. It was though they thought nobody will notice that we've – and it, I, I mean, what do you make of a network that is that deeply in the thrall of a narrative that they will make it up? Well, you know, that's a, a lot of what where the deep blue media has gone over the last five years. And Donald Trump's departure from Washington certainly hasn't changed any. Um, you know, some of the things we've been discussing, you are questions not even being asked. You know, where's The New York Times? Where's CNN asking Rob Manfred 
if he's going to resign his membership at Augusta National and make his boycott of Georgia personal, not just convenient through his corporation. Um, where are they asking the co CEO if, for instance, he's lobbying Boris Johnson in his native country to have any kind of early voting? Um, so they diminish stories they don't like. If they can't find stories that are critical of conservatives, sometimes they'll just make stories up. And they did that at 60 Minutes. I got to ask you about the reconciliation ruling yesterday. I began the show by pointing out we have a $28 trillion uh, debt, which is 133% of the GDP. In 1980, it was 35% of the GDP. Now we have given Chuck Schumer the keys to the kingdom. How significant is yesterday's ruling by the parliamentarian, or do you think maybe we're getting one side of the story? Well, Hugh, I, I, I think that, that sound you hear all across America is people turning the dial to the right when you yep. start talking about Senate floor procedure. But I will say this, this could be important. That is true, because procedure can often lead to genuine results in the law. Um, I will say this. We certainly only heard one side of the story. Chuck Schumer put out a statement last night purporting to represent what our parliamentarian had told him about the ability to pass multiple bills at a simple majority threshold without 60 votes related to taxes and spending. Um, typically, the way this works is the parliamentarian will work with the two sides and they'll go through negotiations and arguments, almost like not quite a courtroom argument, but let's say uh, arbitration, and then she'll provide a ruling to both sides. Uh, sometimes that's made public, sometimes it's not. So until we actually know what our parliamentarian has said, until we understand the exact contours of it, I think it's premature to reach definitive conclusions based solely on Chuck Schumer's press release. I will say this though, Hugh, um, Chuck Schumer's um, effort to try to get multiple bites at the taxing and spending apple just shows you one, how unpopular their agenda is because they don't even try to get Republican support for it. And two, the fact that they want more of your money. So they can spend more of your money. And that's the democratic ambition. And that's the base. That's the essence of their agenda. Is there no uh, center left? And I mean, Joe Manchin is holding the line. Is it just Joe Manchin between us and a 50 trillion dollar debt? Is, it, is he the only thing left? Um, I don't think he's the only thing, at least not right now. I mean, you kind of saw on the middle wage you when the rubber hit the road uh, last month. And there was finally a vote on Bernie Sanders' $15 an hour minimum wage that eight Democrats voted against it, even though only two Democrats have been outspoken against it. So there may be more division and, and more fear inside the Democratic caucus than is apparent um, based on pursuing the very unpopular policies of Joe Biden and Bernie Sanders. Last question. Does anyone talk about the danger of inflation? Senator, you were even born, I don't think, when I bought my first house for 12 and percent. Uh, interest rate over a 30 year. Uh, honestly, do they not know what inflation does to people? So I, I think a lot of people in Washington, Hugh, believe that inflation, inflation has been predicted nine of the last two times it occurred, um, and especially since the 2007, 2008 recession, that people have been predicting inflation and it hasn't happened. Um, what worries me now is that it's not just potential increased demand and increased money supply, but there are still significant supply constraints, Hugh. And that's a there's, those are circumstances that are more ripe for inflation than we've seen in 14 years. I mean, anyone who's trying to buy a home or remodel a home right now knows that prices are sky high, that delays are very long because you just, you know, you can't get lumber, you can't get copper, you can't get tar for uh, the roof. Uh, and that thing, that is magnified across every sector of the economy as we're still dealing with the supply shocks of the shutdowns of the last year and the coronavirus's impact on manufacturing and production. So at a time when you have increasing demand as we come out of those shutdowns and the money supply is growing and stagnant or even decreasing supply in many vital goods, the conditions are ripe for inflation. I hope we don't have that. One way to make sure we don't have it is for Congress not to have another $2 trillion budget blowout. I hope, uh, gosh, I hope people heard that. I'm going to print that. I'm going to post that. Thank you, Senator Cotton. Have a good day. Stop by Piggly Wiggly on your way north. I want everyone to also, there is no supply problem with relieffactor.com. They have plenty of it. If you head over to relieffactor.com, they will send you a three-week starter pack for $19.95. Then you can go out and exercise all of your anxiety away. You can go for a nice long walk, be outside, breathe the fresh air. Spring has sprung. The uh, cherry blossoms are out inside the Beltway. Get your relieffactor.com and get outside and get moving. 1995 gets you started. Then come right back to the Hugh Hewitt Show last segment. Your phone calls at 
520-1234. Piggly Wiggly employees are welcome. 1-800-520-1234. Connection to the Hugh Hewitt Show. Trending now on the Dennis Prager Show. It, it is a force of pure destruction. If it's good, the left destroys it. America was largely good. America is composed of 330 million flawed human beings. It is amazing that it got as good as it did. The amazing thing is not the bad that exists, which is universal. The amazing thing is the good that exists, which is unique or extremely rare. You don't judge people by the same flaws, or you don't judge a society by the same flaws that every other one has. You judge it by what makes it exceptional, either worse, like a communist or fascist or Nazi country, or better, like America. I have a particular love of classical music, as you know. You know who love classical music the most, by far, certainly in the young generation, are Asians, Koreans, Chinese, and... Japanese in particular. If you look at European orchestras, there are so many Asian players. The, the non-West may save the West. I'll tell you who may save Catholicism, and maybe all of Christianity, is, are Africans. Keep up with what's trending. Subscribe on YouTube today. Trending now on the Larry Elder Show. All this energy, all this passion for a bill that they consider to be racist. Have they read it? Have they seen the Yale study that shows that despite the so-called voter suppression measures, hasn't affected the black vote at all? If anything, it might have encouraged blacks to vote even more as if to say, oh, really, you're trying to suppress my vote? I'll show you. No evidence whatsoever that these alleged voter suppression measures are, in fact, suppressing the black vote. None. Moreover, as I've said, poll after poll after poll over the years has shown that blacks support photo voter ID almost to the same degree as whites do. But here's what they're doing. They're characterizing the issue, as they always do, as one as an attack against black people. That way, blacks remain eternally angry. The Democrats continue their image as the party of pro-social justice, uh, and they characterize the Republican Party as a party that wants to attack black people. Welcome back, America. It's Hugh Hewitt. Thank you so much for listening today. I, um, I have to emphasize something Senator Cotton just said. Uh, I, there, aren't, there are supply problems in the United States, and I've been trying to illustrate for you inflation today, and uh, maybe not successful. I've been talking about the fact that the debt can now be raised by Chuck Schumer and 51 Democrats uh, endlessly under an alleged ruling by the parliamentarian, Senator Cotton expressed some skepticism. And if you want to express a, a skepticism, you call me at 1-800-520-1234. But what happens when you have too much money chasing too few goods? And of course, Senator Cotton had a better example. Try buying a house right now. Just try buying a house anywhere in America. Because we're not making many houses. Housing supply plummeted over the last five years. And in the, in the uh, COVID shut down. A lot of houses stopped getting built. And I just took a look, a map uh, uh, around Northern Virginia. 
to see what's for sale. There's just nothing for sale. I mean, there are a few ridiculous houses for like $5 million and $6 million. There are a few crazy houses available. But generally speaking, if you want to buy a house in Northern Virginia, you're screwed. There's just nothing to buy. If you go up to LA, same thing is going to be the case. You are not going to be able to find, and I, uh, Austin, Texas, in which I have never set foot, but to which a lot of young America wants to move because of South by Southwest, and they heard they have a pretty good bar scene. Let's go to Austin, Texas. Try buying a house in Austin, Texas. And what is happening is housing inflation. So that when you see people offering more money for a house than it's been listed at, that's an inflationary effect. And I read you the Wall Street Journal story yesterday, Sacramento. Now, God loves Sacramento, I do. Nice and leafy, it's the most Midwestern place in California. But Sacramento is nothing to write home about, right? It's a nice place to live. It's not on the ocean, it's, it's, it's not a resort. It's a nice town to live in. Good downtown, you have to put up with state legislators and lobbyists, but it's a nice place to live. You can't buy a house. Your house does not make it to the market in Sacramento because there's too much money. People have pent up demand. They have been indoors for a year. They're starting to come out. They want to buy houses and the houses are not on the market. And what does that do? That leads to more inflation because once it gets started, it's pretty hard to stop. So someone starts offering over asking. So, you know, you, you consult a professional realtor trademark are, you know, professional realtor. And you go to a realtor and say, what is my house worth? And they will say X. And, and you'll say, normally, or two years ago, you said, okay, list it for X. Let's hope we get X. And in, instead, now you're going to say, maybe we should list it for X plus 10%. You never know. And so your realtor says, yeah, you're right. It's pretty hot, hot housing market. So let's put it out there for X plus 10%. I've lost the Steelers fans, but that's okay. Uh, and, and all of a sudden, before you even have an open house, some nice young couple comes along with a letter from Andrew and Todd.com that says they can afford X plus 25% and they're willing to pay it to you. And they have their financing approved. If you only promise not to put it on the market, if you sell it to them, then you have a dilemma. You have a dilemma. Are there more people like that out there? Or are they the only ones who are dumb enough to pay us 25% more than we would have been willing to sell it? And you probably sell it to them. But then that goes onto the, onto the grid. And the next person who sells their house says, I am going to go exactly what they sold that for, but maybe I can get 10% more. And that's the inflationary effect of supply limits. That's what Senator Cotton, not just that we got too much money and we're printing money, it's that we have not kept up on supply. So people can't buy what they want. Same thing is going to happen to cars, by the way, because we didn't make as many cars during the COVID year. It will take a long, long time for supply to get to demand. So where's that money going? It's going into the stock market, number one. It's going into gold. It's going into hard assets, which are um, invulnerable to inflation, a little bit invulnerable to inflation, not necessarily invulnerable to inflation. But I'm telling you, Democrats with an unlimited spending, oh my gosh. I hope there are more people like Joe Manchin. Bob in Pennsylvania. Go ahead, Bob. Good morning, you. How are you? I'm great. Happy belated Easter, my friend. And to you. So, uh, you, I, I was listening to you all morning and, and relative to the construction industry and that. Uh, we were thinking about putting an addition on our house, and we've got two estimates. The guy already told us it's going to be twice to three times the amount. Because the lumber prices have gone up. Crazy. Wow. Really? Uh, you were off by 100%? Oh, yeah. Um, like plywood, uh, like it used to be like $43 a sheet at $63 a sheet. Two by fours are like $6 uh, versus like 2 or $3. Um, so a lot of contractors are saying, I can't lock into this price because you never know. So we're going to hold off. Or maybe first of the year and hope that the prices of uh, wood go down. I don't know that, if a lot of people know that. But. Yeah, because when things are more expensive, people produce more of it. That is called supply and demand. But right now, the reason that might not happen, Bob, is we're printing money. So some people just oh, yeah. got a check and they can walk in and buy that two by four for six bucks and not even think about it because it's not their money. They got it from the government. Oh my gosh, we are in. Inflation is coming. Inflation is coming. 
Uh, and Bob is right to be avoiding debt. As in, do not have adjustable rate mortgages, friend. Do not have adjustable mortgages or credit card debt. Get out of debt and get here tomorrow for the next Hugh Hewitt show.